Ladies and gentlemen, if you would have a seat, please, and kind of quiet down. We're actually having a meeting tonight, so I hereby call this committee of the whole meeting to order. Uh, Councillor Winter is excused this evening, and Councillor Benton will be arriving soon. All other councillors are present, I think, or at least close to being present. Please stand for a moment of silence, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance led by Stephanie Yarrow. And to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you all for being here this evening. And Stephanie, thank you for leading us. Uh, just some housekeeping. Uh, the Civic Plaza parking passes are provided for members of the public. You can obtain a parking pass from council staff at the sign-up table. Tonight is the first of three public hearings the council is required to hold on the city's operating budget. Tonight's meeting will focus on the social goal budgets, which include cultural services, family and community services, fire, police, parks and recreation, and senior affairs, among others. On May 10th, the council will hold a second public hearing to discuss the city's physical goal budgets, which include aviation, DMD, planning, and transit, among others. At tonight's meeting and the meeting on May 10th, we will receive public comment. The council will hold a third committee of the whole meeting on May 17th to consider amendments or four substitutes to the bills on tonight's agenda. No public comment will be taken at the May 17th meeting. At the end of the May 17th meeting, the budget as amended or substituted will be sent to the Monday, May 21st City Council meeting for adoption. Public comment will be taken at the May 21st Council meeting. We do appreciate everyone being here this evening and your participation in this process. It's one of the most valuable tools the Council has in order to determine whether or not the proposed budget meets the needs of the citizens of Albuquerque. We do have several um, signed up for public comment, so we will go to that public comment with each speaker having two minutes. The green light on the podium will turn yellow when you have 30 seconds remaining. At two minutes, it will turn red and ring to signal your time is up. I want to please ask you to hold your applause, hold your comments. Please be respectful of all speakers whether you like what they say or not, because that is the right thing to do. This is the same as a court of law. Please be respectful and let this meeting go forward because we do have quite a few speakers. So the first speaker is, I'm gonna call three speakers' names and you will be speaking in that order. Uh, after the second one is finished, I'll call more. So please, all of you, when I call your name, come to the front and be prepared to stand up. First speaker is Jay Spang. Good evening, sir. Good evening, Council. How are you? Thank you, uh, Common Council, for your continued support of Warehouse 508 by NMX Sports. Uh, my name is Jay Spang. Um, I'm here with Eddie Vargas, and we're here to discuss, unfortunately, our financial crisis um, that we're having. Uh, for the past nine years, NMX Sports has been running an incredibly successful program uh, after school program at Warehouse 508. Uh, currently, the city funds Warehouse 508 arts programming with a $219,000 annual contract. We depend largely on fundraising, though, in order to meet our uh, substantial goals, which we've done every year. We've crushed our uh, numbers every year. In fact, we double, sometimes even triple those. Um, our largest fundraiser is our ski card, and as you all know, this was a lousy ski season, <laughs> to say the very least. So. Uh, <laughs> we are at a point now where we're actually going to have to either reduce our uh, programming or even possibly close. Our uh, numbers look like it's going to be September of 18 uh, when we actually run out of money. So that would be a complete disservice to our youth. Uh, it's not an option that I'd like to see happen. I'm not going to let that happen. In fact, um, to, in order to keep the doors open, 
Uh, unfortunately, I had to actually fall on the sword for the organization, so I'm no longer the executive director, um, and Eddie has stepped in as interim director in that case. Uh, so uh, without my salary on the book, it does give us uh, an extension, but not a solution. You know, and this is where the council comes in. This is where you guys can be the hero. You know, this is uh, with a simple vote, you can help us um, make sure that we're thriving and we continue to serve the thousands and thousands of young youth people that come through our doors that we impact. So we need your help to make sure we don't close our doors. I know it's a tough budget cycle, I know, um, but I urge you guys to increase the funding for Warehouse 5 Wave by NMX. And this is as a, as a citizen now <laughs> asking that. So um, I guess my time is out. Is that what that Thank means? Thank you, Mr. Spang. If you'd wait just a moment, uh, Councillor Gibson has a question. Hello, Mr. Spang. I just have a, a couple of questions for you. And um, just in the past year, the past um, 12 months, can you give us an idea of how many kids you have uh, um, serviced and uh, kind of an, an idea of their age range? Absolutely. Our programming ranges from 11 to 20 year olds. Um, so we, we turn no one down. Uh, we make sure that our doors are open for everyone, and we do that through our scholarship opportunity, to which we uh, em empower them through uh, community activism. They, they give us five hours of uh, donated time in order to be able to take our classes. Um, in our classes, we do 1,000 youth every year, and that's about 300 for our sports program and 700 for our arts program. And then we also host 70-plus concerts a year at our facility, and that number ranges anywhere from 7,000 to 14,000 youth coming just for all ages safe shows at our facility. Thank you. Councillor Davis. Mr. Spang, it's good to see you as always. And it's a great program. I know we invested more in capital improvements for the facilities in the last sir. few years. Appreciate have you that. submitted or made a request for specific funding for specific programs this year through the administration or through the council, or do you need to do that? Um, well, uh, I did meet with Mayor Keller on Tuesday to discuss that. Um, obviously, okay. with the new transition, a lot of the meetings have been pushed back. Um, I'm meeting with Carol Pierce here next week, okay. meeting with Shell, and so yes, we are talking with all the divisions, and some things are starting to percolate. Okay. Would you be sure to share whatever you're sharing with them with our staff as quickly as possible so we can put that into our list of stuff? Absolutely. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Spang. Thank you. Next speaker is Eddie Vargas, followed by Jill Lane and John Chavez. Hello, council members. Uh, thank you for hearing me out. As Jay mentioned, my name is Eddie, and I'm the interim executive director for Warehouse 508 and NMX Sports. I would like to add, aside from what Jay said, that uh, NMX 508, aside from running the Warehouse 508 contract for the city of Albuquerque, NMX has also been partnering with Parks and Recreation uh, since the winter of 2005. Since then, NMX has organized and managed the only urban-based learn to ski and snowboard program in the state of New Mexico. We also organized and managed a summer camp with the city that has sold out the past seven summers. Although these programs are partnerships with Parks and Recreation, NMX has continued to do so without any sort of monetary support from the city. All the money has come from programming fees and from our own fundraising efforts. Uh, Parks and Recreation would like to see us expand our programming partnerships with them, and NMX would like to do so. Uh, but to do so would require the council's financial support. I ask that the council considers increasing our budget, doing so just to in ensure our unique and effective programming continues. But thanks for your time. Any questions? Jill Lane, John Chavez, and Marie Coleman. Thank you very much for your time this evening. I represent the Anderson Abruzzo Albuquerque International Balloon Museum, and we are here to remind you of the significance of the Balloon Museum to the city of Albuquerque. We represent the ballooning capital of the world as Albuquerque, and we bring folks from around the world into Albuquerque, and it helps our economic basis here in the city. Some of the great things that are happening at the Balloon Museum, we are actually moving into our second decade. And this year, we're going to exceed over 140,000 visitors. Now, in the past, 
in the early days of the Balloon Museum, many of the visitors came during Fiesta. That's not true anymore. Only 17% of our visitors come during Fiesta. The rest are all aligned with our exhibits, our education programs, and our events at the Balloon Museum. So we serve a very important role to the city of Albuquerque, to the community and the people that live in this community. That's from the children who attend our award-winning, I, I believe we're in our seventh or eighth year award-winning Stories in the Sky Children's Preschool uh, Storytelling Program to our STEM-related exhibits that we're launching and introducing to the community and to visitors from around the world. So our last two exhibits have been very focused on STEM education. So we're really proud of being able to really showcase uh, the ballooning industry and just everything that's innovative about flight for our Albuquerque community as well as for the visitors that come to see us. Uh, we do request that the council, in looking at the budget, recognize that we are a significant player for the city and that we bring value to the city and we, our budget is tight. The foundation does everything we can to raise the revenues and grow the revenues every year and we're doing that to support the education programs and the exhibits, but we need your help as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next is uh, John Chavez, Marie Coleman, and Pat Sanchez. Good evening, counselors. Uh, my name is John Chavez. I'm uh, vice president of the Anderson Abruzzo Albuquerque International Balloon Museum. <laughs> kind of a long-winded uh, way of saying it, but we like to call it the Albuquerque Balloon Museum. Um, and that's why we're here today for asking for your support of that museum. Uh, what Jill just explained is that we're on a, a growth curb. Um, we're one of the we're lucky enough to be one of the growth spots in Albuquerque, gro growing to 140,000 visits. You know that's more than any of the the uh, the, the a museum that gets funded, and I have to mention this uh, three times as much as our museum. We are hardworking. We get down uh, in, in the dirt and get get our hands dirty. Our foundation does, and we, to support the museum. Um, I have to point out an uh, inequity in budgeting. Last year when you took out, uh, the city uh, took out the rentals and the ad uh, admissions from mu museums, what that did to us is that took money away from those museums and at the same time as these museums are growing, uh, both the Albuquerque and, uh, Museum and uh, the Balloon Museum, they don't have the money to repair the addition, to repair the uh, the results of the, uh, the uh, disrepair that occurs because of the many visitors. Uh, we need air conditioning, uh, our air conditioning units are, are uh, uh, need new, new software systems. Our parking lot needs to be restriped. These are wear and tear that, that are occurring on uh, uh, an asset to this city. People visit us and they see our parking lot in disrepair and we still continue to get more and more visitors. We need your help, we need your help. We need to, you to look at the budget more more precisely, we uh, uh, the the management of, of the museum uh, um, proposed a price increase, which was accepted. None of that money was accepted to flow back to us. We have a million dollar budget uh, for from the city. It was kept at a million dollars. We were asking for thirty thousand dollars, thirty thousand just to keep the lights on and keep going. We ask that you reconsider that uh, and uh, support the museums, both of them. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Next is Marie Coleman, Pat Sanchez, and Alaska Piper. Hello. Good evening, counselors. I am Marie Coleman. I own the Church Street Cafe in Old Town, and I'm here to talk to you about public restrooms. <laughs> we definitely need public restrooms in Old Town. Um, we've been promised them before, and it's never happened. And we have some public restrooms in Plaza Don Luis, but it's not sufficient for the crowds that we get. And it's not, it's not sufficient for the people, you know, that come to visit us from all over. I have some property on, um, at the entrance of Old Town off of Romero and uh, Rio Grande, which is right at the entrance. And I'm proposing putting some public restrooms there. Um, I'm asking for the same contract that you give Plaza Don Luis. I'd be willing to maintain them and keep them nice and pleasant and a great place for us to send our visitors who desperately need a bathroom. <laughs> so that's it. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Just a moment, please. Uh, Councilor Benton. 
I just want to thank Marie and uh, Hi, Isaac. Dr. Martinez, uh, también, Chewy, um, for uh, meeting with us, uh, myself and, and Director Simon. Um, this type of thing, uh, public toilets, is, uh, of course, I've been in the news lately with it. Uh, but, uh, but all kidding aside, it's, it's a difficult uh, problem for cities around the country. You can go to cities where they built a very ex you know, large, expensive public toilet, and the doors are locked and barred because the city cannot maintain it properly. So uh, it's a, there's, there's a certain planning element that's really got to be a big part of of the decision making, but I really appreciate Director Simon coming and talking to us about it. Uh, well, thank you for coming to talk. Parks to Department me is only one it. part of uh, of Old Town, but we've got cultural with the museum, and cultural has a long history. Our department has there, uh, uh, and uh, as well as planning and transportation, we got an intersection there with how many twenty eight thousand cars a day or something crazy like that. Uh, there's a lot of a uh, lot of factors in Old Town, so we've got to work together to uh, continue to improve it because it is. Uh, somebody said called something a jewel. That is a jewel, and uh, there's nothing like it. And I always say I'll put it up against Santa Fe any day of the week. Anyway, <laughs> thank you. Thank I you, would Marie. too. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Councilor Borrego. Um, I would just like to know approximately how much each public toilet would cost. If there's a number? I only know what the one that I bought cost, which was second hand at uh, $20,000 per unit. Thank you. That's probably about right for a building as well. Thank you. Next speaker, Pat Sanchez, followed by Alaska Piper and Sean Wells. Good evening. Good evening, City Councilors. I'm, my name is Pat Sanchez. I'm a board member with the Albuquerque Balloon Museum. And just to add some color of my fellow board members on the deferred maintenance issues that we are having at the Balloon Museum. Uh, one of the big things, as mentioned, is the HVAC. Um, like I said, this heats and warms and cools our museum and is currently in need of repair and replacement with a cost of approximately $75,000. And then the biggest thing is the parking lot. As mentioned, with the number of events that are happening there, there are cracks, there are the stripes you can no longer see where people need to park, um, which is a good thing in, in the sense that it's getting a lot of use from all the other events that are being held there. But these deferred maintenance issues that we're having at the Blue Museum really require your consideration for the museum. And I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Alaska Piper, Sean Wells, and Nancy Abruzzo. Good evening, counselors. 145,000 annual visitors. $1 million in local business sales, $35,000 in nutritional services like EBT and WIC distributed. These are some of the social and economic impacts of the rail yards market, a Sunday farmer's market that is so much more than numbers to me and many others. It's a dynamic hub for connection in our community. We've been gathering steam with the city as a supportive partner, but this year our nonprofit free to the public project is not included in the mayor's budget. Last year, we returned 75% of the city funding received back in rent and fees such as permits. We desperately need the city's support to keep our program growing and we are ready to expand. Um, our most recent extra season event, the holiday market, attracted 28,000 visitors in just two days. I humbly request that the rail yards market be restored to the budget so we can continue to be a partner and grow as a catalyst for revitalization in our city. Madam Chair, Councilors, 
I know you see the value in the market. I see many of you there weekly. Thank you for allowing me to speak. I'm always happy to chat and dream about the market's potential over coffee, and I hope to see you all this Sunday at 10 a.m. for our opening. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ms. Piper. Councilor. Madam Chair. Uh, Alaska, thank you uh, for your leadership over the last few years. You've really seen it take off and take flight. And uh, uh, like you say, it's, an, it's, a, it's a gathering place for the community. There's so much more to be done. Um, I, I've heard that, that uh, the administration is very interested in us, uh, you know, restarting. And, um, and I think we're in a good position to do that. But you guys are great. And, you know, there, we really have to go ahead and take a look at, at the next space that's needed. Uh, and, and I think we know where we're going with that, but it, it's all, it's only money, as we say here at the budget committee. <laughs> so, Councillor Benton, thank you. We work very hard to make the, the market an exciting place for the community, and our budget is very small compared right. to some of these other projects. Could you remind the councillors of, of what you, re, uh, of how much subsidy the Ray Yards market got from the city over the last two or three years? Absolutely. We were originally in the budget in 2014 for 50000 um, Last year, we were in the budget for 40000 and we do pay $30,000 to the city in rent, fees, permits, and license agreement In addition contracts. to, so, so that's part of the trade-off, right? Absolutely. Thank you, Councilor. Well, I mean, the, the sheer performance is so impressive compared to uh, what the city's been paying. So, Councilor, is that really... Uh, we have an asset here. Granted, it's a very tarnished asset, uh, the whole rail yards as a whole, but, but nonetheless, it's a, it's a very amazing uh, uh, piece of property and, and of buildings and so forth. And so I think the rail yards market, what's wonderful about it is not just the market itself, but the ability for people to see what the city owns there and dream their own dreams about, about what it should be because we're going to, we're going to take another hard run at it and see if we can get it off the ground. I think it, it started out during bad economic times, let's face it. Let's just face that, that the year that we bought it was when everything crashed. So we need to pick up, pick up, and you guys already have picked up and moved on, so thank you. Councillor Benton, Madam Chair, thank you. We, we are prepared at the Rail Yards Market to be an active partner with the administration and um, helping continue to revitalize the site. We're very excited about that. Thank you. Thank you. Sean Wells, Nancy Abruzzo, and Tracy Sharp. Thank you for accommodating the multimedia experience. Okay, I think we're ready to go, maybe, maybe not. Okay. My name is Sean Wells E. Delgado, and I'm a fifth-generation Spanish colonial artist. I show at the annual Spanish market in Santa Fe, 
and I'm very pleased to be able to provide for my family. Unfortunately, Spanish market only comes once a year, and so I'm always looking for opportunities and, and events uh, where I can show my artwork and share my culture through my images at events, and the rail yards came along, and I was able to uh, sustain myself as a full-time artist. I credit the rail yards for helping me to be able to transition uh, to a full-time artist. My background's actually in architecture, and I did that for 10 years with my husband until the market crashed in 2008, and I was pregnant. I came back here with hat in hand and no money in the bank, and I had to restart my cr career as an artist. And with the rail yard's help, I've been able to, to do that. Uh, in the presentation, um, I'll just show you this graph. This is a graph of my income since participating in the rail yards. In 2011, my income was zero dollars from art. And every year since then, I have been able to double my income. In 2016, it was 28,000, uh, specifically from art. And in 2016, it was over 50,000. So I just wanna show a tangible number to the fact that rail yards is here fostering and incubating small entrepreneurs m like me. When I started this before rail yards, I was on EBT, also known as food stamps, and having a graduate degree and participated in architecture, taking six figures, it was a huge, huge uh, dignity blow to be on food stamps. And although it served me very well, and I was very glad and grateful to have it, I'm very proud to, to um, be able to take care of my family through my art. And I thank Rail Yards, and I, I thank the staff, especially Alaska, who's the bargain of the century. So please support this market, because they're supporting people like me who are, are ready to contribute and give back to the community. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Councilor Davis, and then Councilor Pena. Sorry, I just want to say thank you. I think that's a great example of exactly the type of economic development we should be investing in in Albuquerque. It's culturally important to us. It's something that can't be exported because it's about us and it keeps our money here and it supports each other. And it's a great example of what the rail yards does. Um, Madam Chair, if I can, I just want to ask the CAO very briefly, uh, and I know we'll get into this in another discussion, but can the administration give us a quick overview for folks following along about uh, funding for the rail yards and their perspective on this? Yes, thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, Councillor Davis, uh, yes, thank you. So uh, this year we presented some of the information regarding cultural affairs events in a, in a little different fashion, but when we get to that uh, section of the presentation, we have a memo for the council that details the organizations um, that, that we would propose funding um, for this type of event funding and we'll go over it in detail then, but did want to flag while these folks are still in the audience that we have included in our proposal $40,000 for the rail yard, which matches their money from last year. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thanks, Madam CEO. Thank you, Ms. Nair. Councilor Pena. I was just gonna make a comment. Um, Ms. Wells, um, if everyone knows her, she's just a, a tremendous artist in our community. She actually has designed, I don't know if you've ever seen those bottles of wine that have, it's a collection with all the Dia de los Muertos on it. And um, you know, we were, I was talking to her at the South Valley Pride Day this weekend and she was telling me that they're actually selling on eBay for quite a bit of money and she was uh, letting me know about the uh, first edition and the ones I have are the first edition, so. <laughs> but. I just want to say you're a tremendous art artist. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor Benton. Yeah, and just thanks for for telling your story because uh, I mean I, I think that I've I think that's been multiplied so many times at the rail yard market and uh, and uh, and just also want to you know shout out to to the folks who are working on a, on, on a new Main Street for for Fourth Street in Borellas, which is just a classic Route 66 Street, no no less than any other. Of, uh, of the route and um, uh, and the work of the economic uh, of the uh, coalition who's working to, to cr try to make this a feeder that the rail yards would actually be a feeder for uh, another market on Forest Street so uh, good things happening and and because of good people working so thank you thank you Councillor Benton uh, next speaker is Nancy Abruzzo followed by Tracy Sharp and Terry Neville Councilors, I'm Nancy Abruzzo, and I sit on the Board of Trustees 
for the Balloon, uh, Balloon Museum. I'm here uh, for twofold reasons. First and foremost, it's um, in regards to um, our admission increase that has taken place for the very first time since the inception of the Balloon Museum. And we feel strongly that this increase um, would be a direct benefit to the museum. And so I stand here respectfully asking you for your reconsideration of those potential increase in admission prices directly back to the museum. Um, as it's been spoke to earlier here tonight, our in attendance record has a very strong track record. It has um, had traction over every year. It increases and it exceeds the, the um, estimates that we peg in admissions. And so while I understand the gross receipts tax increase has passed, um, it would be a windfall and such a benefit for the museum and its staff to have access to the potential of uh, $54,000 that's projected in the increase of the admission costs. Um, our costs went from $1 to four, our, our original cost was $1 to $4 and um, we increased it to three to six dollars respectively, so uh, a relatively minor increase. The second half is those long-term deferred maintenance um, that were discussed earlier, our HVAC control panel. I think you'll find that if we get that um, addressed, we might actually save some money in our utility bill, and the deferred maintenance on our parking lot is something that we certainly like to get in the pipeline sooner rather than later. So thank you for your time and your reconsideration of that potential income. Thank you, Ms. Abruzzo. Next speaker, Tracy Sharp, followed by Terry Neville and Endian Schichtel, I think, and I'm sure I murdered that. Good evening. Thank you. I'm Tracy Sharp, and I am here as the executive director for Saranom. It's a nonprofit organization that works with um, families experiencing homelessness and does not receive any city funding or government funding at all. But I'm here in support of uh, adding funding to the family and community services um, section of the budget because I see the great need for the families um, of our community um, in the housing and homeless services. Of course, that's the demographic that I'm serving, but um, for the families that are in our programming, um, accessing resources in the community centers and child development centers and the social services and health um, resources are, are phenomenally important. And so I'm in here in support of increasing the funding to that. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Jeremy Rutherford will be our next and last speaker. Good evening. And tell me how I pronounce your name. No, I'm not the Schicktail. I'm Neville. You're Neville. Schicktail. Okay. After me. All right. Neville, Terry, <laughs> please go forward. Hi there. Thank yes. you. Okay. I'm Terry Neville. And, um, I'm requesting an amendment to the budget to increase funding for family, uh, for planning projects for new or renovated parks. Um, and I believe it's part of the sustainable community development. Um, so I say what's good, Albuquerque's already leading neighboring large cities and other states in park acreage as a percent of city area. Albuquerque has a high rating from the Trust for Public lands and uh, regarding this same measure as far as area. So what's missing? Well, they're almost empty. Why? Because they're boring. The same mass-produced plastic play sets result in packaged imagination. These have replaced the interesting places where unstructured play is sparked by free exploration of natural places also creates social inequality and inaccessibility, the way that our parks are um, situated now. We have those interesting places like the Rio Grande Valley State Park, the Sandy Mountains, and the petroglyphs of the West Mesa. Visiting these places requires an automobile and family commitment. It becomes an issue of disenfranchisement and social inequality. So what we need to do, and we need children to be outside, and we need them outside daily. So what I'm advocating for is parks and recreation, the city council and the mayor can increase funding to the parks to identify, 
plan and implement restructuring of the city parks and open spaces. And I believe this can be done by um, a network of connecting passages from neighborhoods, their own homes, to parks that will allow children to get outdoor in outdoor play spaces. This would empower a generation of independent and healthy citizens for the future. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for coming in. Yes, uh, just a moment, Councilor Benton. Uh, no real question, I just wanna thank you for all your advocacy on, on behalf of this issue and um, you know the entire need. It's an interesting argument, right? that you have to travel to our, some of our best open space. Mm -hmm. and some of our parks are, you know, we're, we've been suffering and, and, and even our park system has been paying a lot of money to the water authority for water because of antiquated systems. And, uh, and of course, that's a long history in and of itself. But uh, I really appreciate the point and, and uh, uh, that experiencing the outdoors is something I took for granted as a kid. And right. I, I can see how it be, would be harder to mm -hmm. take advantage of now. Yeah, it's the, um, those of us over 60 um, know what it feels like to be able to go outside as a child and have those memories that are very real where we were in a touchable landscape. We could touch our landscape, but we're not allowed to play with mud, go under bushes, climb trees, not in these landscapes that we have available to us today. Appreciate your time. Just a sec, Thanks. Councillor Davis. Ms. Neville, I just want to thank you for bringing this to us earlier. I know we I appreciate our email conversation earlier. Yes. Uh, we're going to take a look at all of this uh, with Mr. Simon, our new director of parks. But I also, and I appreciate this, I just want to get it on the record. Mm -hmm. I encourage you and other folks like this to engage with our Parks and Rec Board. We've appointed some new folks there that help advise the Parks and Rec Department mm -hmm. on planning parks and doing that work. And I think this is an excellent place to engage them okay. um, and get some buy-in to a new process. And that certainly will be a key component of us changing our process for that and I encourage you to talk to them okay. so that we're working from both sides. Right. Thank okay. you. Okay, thanks. Just to say, Councillor Borrego. Um, I want to thank you for bringing this to our attention. This morning I visited one of the parks in my district mm -hmm. and I came to find that it was not handicap accessible and it was not even accessible. It was on a hill and a slope and I, I'm going to be working on that particular park. I won't mention the name right now, but... Um, you know, also not just children, but also seniors, especially when they're healing or they're in some sort of, right. um, you know, they've been hospitalized. Mm -hmm. Being in the outdoors helps them to, to heal. So I, I very much appreciate that you brought this forward. And like you say, you know, the, the people um, need this kind of diversity too, you know, to see and, and feel the dappled shade over there of the trees, but they also need to walk through bushes and touch plants. And, and, um, and especially for the handicapped, it's really important, right, to modify these places. And children need to be able to pick up sticks and, and, and look underneath um, dirt and soil and leaves. They need to feel all of that. And it's good for their gut. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. Thank you for coming in. Oh, one more, uh, ma'am. Councillor Harris has a question. It's a, more of a comment, but you can come up if you don't like. We actually are uh, changing to a degree some of the, uh, the ways we're thinking about parks in the city of Albuquerque. And we have a fairly new park in my district at Four Hills Park. And what the Parks Department did in Four Hills Park is they have these huge boulders in the middle of the park and they're very sharp. And I was like, well, this kids could get hurt on this. And, and the, the new view about these parks is that you want kids to like take risks. Yes. Okay. Yes. And, and there's like this invitation, like climb all over these rocks. Mm -hmm. And some of them are kind of sharp and looking and big. And, uh, and, and kids are crawling all over them all the time. So it's not, so in the way the park is set up, kids go from one place to another. They, you know, they have the swings and play equipment, but then the park is very interactive itself. So I think we're starting to look at that. Mm -hmm. And maybe we do have to accept that maybe some plants will get damaged sometimes. Maybe that's something we have to look at. Exactly. We've invested so much money into plants and like you say, watering them. I mean, let's 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 break up some of this a little bit. Let it let it just happen. And you'd be surprised what, what does remain. And also these plants, if you put in the native plants, they're used to browsers, you know, the deer that come by, the, the native plants that we have here, which also fit in well with the native pollinators. So it's all a system 
that we've kind of ignored. Well, we can bring in some Mediterranean plants too and fill there because those guys are always going to be green. But thank you, ma'am. We appreciate thanks. your passion. Thanks so much. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Bye bye. Uh, Mr. Schechtel and then Jeremy Rutherford. Ms. Schechtel. Man, I have your name wrong in every way. My apologies. Oh, I'm used to it. It's all right. Thank you. Um, my name's Andian Schichtel. Thank you. Um, my name's Andian Schichtel, and what I have up here is just examples of exactly what Terry was talking about. They are things that kids have used their imaginations to create out of sticks that they found. I'm an educator for the Water Utility Authority. I'm contracted with them. I also help run a forest kindergarten in the Bosque with Terry. So we get to see firsthand risky behavior and how beneficial it is. And um, how amazing these kids are when they come out of it, not only from their imaginations of making paintbrushes and wands out of a stick or a crown, but they develop these incredible character skills that almost can't be taught in a classroom. And then they really learn how to, to appreciate where they're from and take care of it in, in a very organic manner. And we do need to restructure city parks that not every kid can get out to these cool places or be in a program that we have. And that's really unfortunate. Um, there's, there's so much science-based evidence that I could go through a list that encourages social interaction and independent thinkers, increased imaginative creative play, reduce ADHD, reduce obesity, reduce stress, higher test scores. They're happier children. They have better cognitive ability in the long run. Um, and I, I'd be happy to work with Terry and, and your Park and Rec's development design people to, to fix our parks. And I'm happy to do that. Thank you, ma'am. We appreciate your coming in. Jeremy Rutherford is our last speaker. Thank you, Madam Chair, Councilors. I'm Jeremy Rutherford. I'm also here on behalf of the Albuquerque Anderson Abruzzo International Balloon Museum. I represent them at the state, at the legislature. Also ballooning, all things ballooning in Albuquerque and New Mexico are very near and dear to my family. Um, when I'm asking for a capital outlay up at the legislature, one of the first things I'm asked is, is this on the city's plan? And it obviously usually is not. And I'd like to encourage you to find a way to, if not put these things on your plan, to find a way to endorse these things with your local legislators so that they know that the city does support them. I want to point out that over the last 25 years of the Bloom Museum, legislators from Torrance, Valencia, Sandoval, Santa Fe, and Bernalillo County have all given money towards the museum for capital outlay needs. Um, it's, this is a big deal and the legislators know it, the state knows it. Um, I would also like to ask you, um, not as capital needs, but some of the things the Balloon Museum needs from the city now. Uh, they need a volunteer coordinator. They don't have one on staff right now. A volunteer coordinator brings ex exponential results because then you get free people coming in and working at the museum um, just for the joy of it. They also need to expand their educational programs. They're sort of maxed out right now. Um, more funding they could do things 365 if they had the funding to do it. There's just that much interest in everything they do there. It's not just ballooning. There's all kinds of programs that take place there. Drones, renaissance, all kinds of things. Um, they also need to improve their visitor services and building operations. The attendance is growing. Their collections are growing. They need to maintain their collections to work towards accreditation. They have amazing collections. What they really need is conservation. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. I believe that's our last speaker for the evening. 
so next on the agenda, we will be hearing from Sanjay Bhakta, the Chief Financial Officer, followed by Gerald Romero, the Budget Officer. Uh, good evening, Mr. Bhakta. Good evening, uh, Madam Chair and Council. I'm excited to be here. Uh, this is uh, something we have been working hard, and I want to recognize uh, uh, our support staff here, especially Jerry Romero, uh, the budget officer, and his uh, uh, support staff, the professional staff. Uh, they have been working hard. I'm amazed at uh, their professionalism, their institutional knowledge, historical knowledge, and also their commitment and willingness to uh, share that knowledge with us and make this happen for us. Uh, today we will be talking about uh, overall uh, budget uh, at a high level and then we will uh, uh, discuss in detail the social goals departments. Uh, all the directors are here, uh, but I'll give you certain highlights uh, of the budget, uh, especially uh, the hold harmless 3-8 tax and how we are going to use that. Uh, as you know, uh, the 3-8 uh, grocery tax was approved and enacted in March 2018. Uh, it takes effect on July 1st. Uh, the staff had been working with TRD to make sure that uh, they have it in place. So I think logistically they are ready. Uh, the tax would be collected beginning August uh, for, the, for the activity of July and we will uh, begin to receive that uh, in September. So for the first year, uh, we will get the revenue of about 11 months, uh, which would be approximately $49.6 million. Of that, we would be able to use about $45.5 million. The rest, which is 1 12th, needs to be reserved. Uh, the, this is the pie chart for this uh, $45.5 million revenue uh, related to hold harmless uh, portion. Uh, of that, 80% uh, would be used on the public safety. 15% uh, would be used on increase in the healthcare cost. This is the city's portion on the healthcare cost and also uh, we are uh, helping the employees by giving 1% raise, which we are counting as a healthcare cost because that is for them to defray their portion of the healthcare premiums. There is also this 5% loss of whole harmless. It is actually 6% uh, phase out, which translates into about $2.3 million. So that is that gap which this new tax will help us fill. Uh, as far as the public safety, uh, I'll, I'll give you some highlights of 45.5 million. We will use 80% uh, for the public safety in our community. The mayor and this administration's intent is to address crime from every possible angles. We believe that council also has similar vision based on the legislation that passed 821 to increase this revenue. Council unanimously approved an amendment to the gross receipt tax legislation that considered crime prevention as a component of public safety. The council also voted to use no less than 60% of the proceed for public safety and as you will see, we exceed that requirement and we have allocated 80% of that to the public safety. So primarily the, the administration developed the budget with these two amendments in mind. Uh, we, we believe this budget reflects council's objectives identified in uh, ordinance 18-9 and this budget reflects the mayor's vision of attacking crime from all sides including initiatives aimed at addressing our community's struggles with homelessness, mental health challenges, addiction, education, and domestic violence. 
Crime prevention and intervention includes investing in our children. The mayor has allocated, this is just one of the examples from the list which we'll uh, see in the next slide. The mayor has allocated $954,000 for family and community services, parks and recreation, cultural services departments to double the total number of students who are kept off the streets and out of harm's way through before school, after school, and summer and early childhood programming. In addition to the budget, the administration has instructed our directors to work together to address public safety on all fronts, and they are working together. Our chiefs and directors understand that we are one city, not 22 or so different departments, and they need to leverage their resources to improve the safety of our community. This is a list of uh, the portion of the new tax revenue of which 80% is allocated to public safety. I will not go into details of all of this because when we uh, have the detailed discussion on the department's budget, the directors uh, would talk about it. However, uh, certain items I would like to highlight is uh, from this majority of the items are allocated to either APD or the fire department. Uh, the first and the major alliance portion is $12.8 million, which includes a reserve appropriation for 40 new officers plus funding for salaries, benefits to, to be used in a compensation package intended to retain officers, hire new officers, and attract lateral officers. So this total package would add about 100 police officers in fiscal year 2019. The other item, a major item here is $4 million for the police vehicles. We have an aging fleet at APD. Not only that, with the new officers that we are going to uh, recruit, there will be need for more vehicles. This $4 million will supplement $800,000 that we are going to get from the state, uh, which they appropriated in the last budget cycle. We will get that in July. And it also uh, will add to about $3.2 million, which, which we uh, had in the 2017 GO bond. And the first of that GO bond, uh, uh, first of those $125 million, we sold the bonds uh, in the beginning of April uh, for $84 million. And from that, $3.2 million is allocated for the vehicle. So we believe that this $4 million plus $3.2 million and $800,000 uh, is, is, uh, will help the APD to uh, much, uh, the need to replace the vehicles and add some new vehicles. A $2.3 million is related to DOJ court approved settlement agreement. Uh, there is a total of 12 positions, nine of them uh, are new, and that is to comply with the DOJ uh, settlement. $1.9 million is ad to address the backlog at the crime lab. I think this is a good messaging. The, the, the criminal should know that we are, you know, uh, analyzing the data, and that would help us uh, tackle the crime. Uh, there is also $1.2 million for the new technology projects related to fighting crime as outlined by DTI in three-year plan. Uh, as you are aware, we, we had uh, folks visiting from uh, New York uh, Police Department and they also looked at this plan and I think uh, this is something similar to what they have. So this should help uh, to tackle the crime. Last but not least from this list is uh, $102,000 for Safe uh, City Strike Force. This is for the planning department to sort of uh, identify uh, the houses uh, which, which needs repair, uh, which needs to be boarded up. So this would help our uh, public safety initiative. 
I would like to discuss some uh, outlook uh, related to economy uh, in the next few slides. Uh, the total employment growth rate, as you can see here, uh, is barely about 1% right now. And traditionally, we have been lagging uh, with the federal growth rate. In Albuquerque area, uh, the employment growth rate is the driving factor for the economic growth. Uh, and it's been stagnant. Uh, I see that we are actually going to do slightly better uh, in our projection compared to the, to the US federal uh, growth rate. However, it may be because of some time we lag into the growth and we are a little bit behind when it uh, the trend is declining. So we, are, we are slightly behind the federal trend here. However, just this is not very optimistic picture. Uh, this also tells us that we have an issue with our population. I think we, we have a very minimal population growth which is primarily attributed to uh, the difference between the death and the newborn, which is just a natural growth, and that's not sufficient for any economy to kind of thrive. Uh, but if we somehow can grow the economy, I think the employment will grow, and then we will be able to attract more people. Uh, but we, we had a huge, uh, you know, uh, spike in 70s and 80s, and I, I believe those days are behind us, unfortunately. The next slide, uh, there is some comparison uh, of historical uh, groceries tax base. And we have used the data of that 1% which we get from the state, because that is the constant component within the, within the groceries tax amount that we receive. The other components uh, changes uh, with change in the tax rate, but this is pretty uh, good data to compare. And as, as you can see, we had a humongous you know, uh, spike in 79 and uh, then early 80s and mid 80s, but you know, we, we, we haven't quite recovered from the recession of 2008. It's been, it's, the growth had been very muted Again, if you actually look at the real data with uh, inflation adjusted rate, uh, the actual growth is barely above uh, zero, uh, just about 1%, which kind of validates the other data we have on the population and also the employment growth. Uh, so I just want to caution the council moving forward. We, ha we will have to be very prudent, even though we have additional revenue uh, through the whole harmless new legislation, I think the outlook is pretty uh, pretty muted. Uh, I'm, I mean, the only thing I can brag about is that it's just above zero, but there is nothing else to brag about here, unfortunately. So we have, we need to really focus on economic growth to to kind of drive uh, the revenue base here. The next slide. We have uh, the growth of uh, grocery tax base for the current year. As you can see, the distribution, uh, which is the actual distribution we receive from TRD, is in the red, and that's very volatile. And that is, as we all know, they have issues there with reconciliations and clawback. So it's very difficult to predict what we will get uh, next month. However, if you look at uh, the cumulative growth, again, initially, I think in our five-year plan, our growth expectation was about 2.3%, uh, which we revised to 1.7. And right now, we are trending at 1.2%. So that, that's not really good news. However, we have three good months uh, coming and there is, there is a time to catch up and our economist is uh, actually pretty optimistic that we will catch up. Uh, in the next slide we have the gross receipt tax growth by the sector. This is uh, 
kind of uh, interesting slide, we have consistent growth in accommodations, uh, the hotels and the food services, which is good. It's, uh, it's, it's been like that for more than a year now. The construction is also doing really well. The two things to consider here is that the food service and lodging industry growth is good. We will take it, but they really don't create high-paying jobs. You know, they, these are just uh, low-level jobs. And the construction is good. However, it's generally one time, and the jobs created in construction industry tend to be not permanent. Uh, though it, it's, it's good, I don't know how, how uh, long it will continue like that. The one thing which is troubling here is uh, medical hold harmless. There is a decline of uh, almost 28%, which sort of doesn't make sense because the health care is up by 6%, and the medical is somewhat related field. It should have same growth. That said, if the health care was 6%, uh, if the health care growth was 6%, Medical, because of the whole harmless, could be zero, and I would actually accept it because the 6% is the phase-out portion. But instead of 6%, it's almost minus 28. So there is something wrong in how we are getting the money. It could be an issue at the TRD, which we have discussed in past. Or it could be also a reporting issue. Uh, same like uh, food as well, where if the things are growing, why would food not grow, which, which, is, which kind of beats me. And Councillor Davis actually had a very good suggestion a couple of months ago that we, we identify the grocers, retailers, and educate them. So I, I want to report to you that we did that. We, we uh, figured out how to communicate with them, and we wanted to let TRD know that we want to do this and we need your blessings, and uh, you know they are not happy about it, and uh, they think that we will confuse the taxpayers. They have a little bit of a point, and they are also saying, not in writing though, they, they spoke to our economist and said that they are doing certain things, they have identified certain taxpayers, and they are working with them, and they know that there is an issue with the reporting. So hopefully, you know, that would be fixed. Um, our Deputy Director of Finance and Administration, Olivia, wrote an email to them that, can you give this to us in writing and kind of give us a high level uh, uh, outline of what exactly you are doing. Uh, I haven't seen the response yet. Uh, Madam but Chair. we'll see, we'll, we'll continue to monitor this. Uh, yes, Madam sir. Chair, if I could interrupt. Mr. Yes, Proctor, thank Councilor you for. Davis. Thank you for following up. You beat me to it. I wrote that note. And I was going to ask the progress on talking to our grocers mainly yeah. about the appropriate use of hold harmless. Can, I, can you just clarify for me? It sounds like you were working with TRD. Have we done any of that education yet? Or we're, we're trying to be good partners with TRD first, right, to be sure we're doing that together? Is that what I understand? We, uh, Councillor Davis, we actually have a, a, a communication, a memo, kind of on a postcard, which was about to go okay. to the grocers. But we wanted to check that box. Sure. We didn't want to surprise TRD. It was kind of, you know, uh, the way they do a protocol us to, to let them at least know. And generally, they don't respond uh, quickly. But when we told them that we are going to do this, they actually responded very hey. quickly and said that don't do it right now okay. because they are doing certain things. So Good. we are going to give them an opportunity Great. to explain to us what they are doing. And if that's fine. And we also said that we, we stand ready to help you uh, educate people. Uh, anything Th you can do. So. Mr. Bakhti, thank you for taking the initiative to do that for your team as well. I know long term that'll pay off for the city in, in fair revenues and hopefully in this back and forth sort of we have with them. So thank you and thanks for giving us an update. And I appreciate that suggestion. Thank you for that. <clears throat> in the next slide, we have uh, adjustment to the gross receipts. Uh, this is sort of a reconciliation of uh, the growth rate without the adjustment, which is 2.3, to adjust adjusted rate of 1.7 because there is this uh, food and uh, medical hold harmless portion which we are reducing. And then in future years, we also have this tax increment 
development district reduction, which is a slight decrease. Uh, so that will impact our total revenue. Again, you know, uh, this growth rate of 1.7 to 2.2 in FY19 and 2.5 is kind of muted. And I, I, I wish that it would be more, and we will we'll work on it. With that, uh, uh, Madam Chair and uh, Councillor, I thank you for your time. Uh, and I'm going to hand over to Jerry, who would go into the details of uh, each department's appropriation. And we are all here to answer your questions at the end of it. Thank you again. Thank you, Mr. Bakta. I think there might be a few questions for you first. Councillor okay. Davis. I promise it's not all me tonight. Uh, Mr. Bakta, just can you clarify for me, I know the administration is proposing um, and has budgeted for a 2% across the board increase, except for bargaining units with a different concept. But I also heard you mention that, uh, if I got this right, part of, of course, increasing our healthcare premiums means we take 80%, our employees still pay their 20. And so was that about a 1% that I heard you say? And I think I'm trying to ask, are we giving, are we, is the administration recommending a 2% that is in reality a one because of the compensated premium or is it really a three that results to two? No, it, it is two, it is one plus one. So the first okay. 1% we are considering that to help them defray the cost of their portion of increase in the health premium. Thank you. And then other 1% is just, uh, and then 1% then uh, is an approximate amount we think will will defray cost for, I would say, you know, 90% of the employees. Thank you. And Mr. Bakhtin, Madam Chair, if I could follow up. In the proposal that the administration has set aside for bargaining units negotiations, some of which is, um, I, some of which is larger, some of which is sort of more on par there, are you accommodating for that 1% in the recommendations there, or is that simply an extra chunk for them to work out that would have, they would have to accommodate the 1% in their recommended budget allowance. Councillor Davis, before I uh, put my foot in the mouth, I think- uh, We can uh, follow up uh, later. <laughs> Ms. Nair had been uh, kind of working on this okay. uh, area and- And we can come back to it later we as we get to negotiations. Yeah. Those are different and it's up to the subject of negotiation. I'm just curious if you had accommodated for that or not. Thank you. Ms. Nair, would you like to answer that? <laughs> sure. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair, Councillor Davis. So, of course, as everyone up here knows, any of the um, raises related to a bargaining unit need to be subject to those negotiations. Uh, so if you're, if you're asking about uh, police and fire and whether that, that is sort of in the mix, I think uh, all of those things are, are being taken into account as we negotiate those contracts. Thank you, ma'am. And Councilor Borrego? Um, Sanjay, thank you for your presentation. I, I wanted to ask you, and I wanted to go back to table five, um, and kind of back to the recession and sort of our recovery. And it seems like we've only sort of leveled out at this point in time with the 1%. And I appreciate your comment um, regarding, you know, be cautious because I think that, you know, after a recession, I mean, we know that there are trends that go up and down. And, you know, I think that it, that comment is very, um, I mean, it could go either way. And I, I know you don't have a, a magic, you know, crystal ball, but um, I guess the question that I'm asking is, um, do you anticipate that, you know, I mean, historically, it shows that when there's a recession, that the the market goes up and down, and and you know we've we've only recovered in what I think 2009, maybe well, not quite 10 years, and um, you know the future is sort of in limbo a little bit right now, I think, and you know I I know that the growth in Albuquerque has been low, significantly low, you mentioned that. So I'm just kind of wondering um, what your thoughts are. I mean, you do this on a regular basis, I don't. So I'd like to kind of hear your kind of your thoughts regarding that and maybe some of what the economists are telling you for New Mexico. 
Madam Chair and uh, Councillor Borrego, that's an excellent question. Uh, as I think you answered my question, I don't have the crystal ball. That said, though, <laughs> I think uh, traditionally, uh, you know, our staff is very proud of how we gather the data. You know, we have uh, very credible sources for this data, and generally, there is not much deviation from this outlook. However, the one thing which hasn't been considered in this is that especially in the Albuquerque uh, statistical uh, yeah, area, uh, you know, th there is an impact on the economy uh, with the perception of uh, the public safety issue, which, you know, uh, doesn't attract businesses, therefore it doesn't create employment, therefore it doesn't contribute to the growth with enhanced focus on public safety, personally I'm optimistic that that will change. And hopefully that would have some impact in a very positive and meaningful way that this growth will be slightly more than what's been projected. I guess just to follow up on that, I guess my question is, or my concern rather, is with regards to goods and services and you know how that impacts our future. And I, it seems to be trending in a positive way, but you know that's yet to be seen. Um, and you know, what, are we sort of in an inflation? I mean, have we gone into that phase, or are we kind of staying away from that? Councilor Borrego, no, we are coming out of recession. Only it's very muted. Uh, numbers that I see uh, when you come out of the recession, uh, you know, as, as I mentioned before, we are lagging. Uh, but I don't think this is a recession. We are certainly out of that. What I'm asking is inflation. Inflation, no, I don't think so. Uh, as you see in one of the slides uh, that our growth is about 2%, I think it's slide number six, and then uh, the real, the growth is about 2%, and then it is projected that there would be a gap of about 2% between the nominal number and the infl inf uh, inflation adjusted numbers. And that 2% growth, uh, that 2% gap rather, uh, is the inflation rate. And that 2% is actually, I would say, healthy inflation rate, and that's expected yeah, over the years. Yeah. That's my question. Thank yeah. you so much. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Bakhtar. Any other questions? Thank you, sir. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah. Uh, we'll go with uh, Gerald Romero, the Budget Officer, with the continued presentation. Madam Chair, if it's okay with you, I'll stay here since I, I'm set up. Um, so I'm just going to hit a few uh, highlights of the overall budget in the first few slides and then we'll move on to individual departments. If it's okay with you, we'll have one slide per department, and I'll ask if, if um, you would like to have the director up for questions, and then we'll go on to the next slide after um, those questions and answers are, are done. If that's okay with you, Madam Chair. I think that would be perfect, Mr. Romero. Thank you. Okay. On this slide, um, it's an overall picture in two pie charts of the fiscal year 19 budget. So this would be all funds. You're only seeing some of them tonight, mostly general fund. As you know and mentioned earlier, uh, at the next Cal meeting, we will have the enterprise funds, which include uh, airport and transit and solid waste. Um, the overall budget right now is balanced with recurring revenues actually in excess of recurring expenses which is a good thing uh, as we look to hire even more police officers in fiscal year 20 and in the out years of our forecast. Um, after eliminations of interfund transfers, the overall operating budget stands now at 995 million. So we're almost a billion dollar operating uh, operation here. Something I think, um, counselors, you can, you can put on your resumes someday saying you, you oversaw a billion dollar budget It'll, it'll get to a billion next year for certain. And this does not include the capital program, so this is just all the operating funds. So I'm certainly gonna put it on my resume someday. <laughs> um, resources, so 
the resources right now, if you look at all, all funds once again, uh, gross receipts tax still makes up a pretty good portion. And I can't see my own slide. I believe it's about 34% if that's, if that's correct. Property tax is almost 16% when you include the pieces that go to the debt service. Um, thank you. And then we've got, um, of course, enterprise uh, revenues that bring in about 15% of the overall uh, so sources of funds. We do use fun fund balance from prior years, which makes up some of it as departments underspend or we have additional revenue that's used in the subsequent year primarily for non-recurring expenses. In terms of how we spend it, we mostly spend it on personnel. As you're fully aware, it's a very labor-intensive operation to run government. Almost 50% of our um, expenses go to personnel. Here's an overall uh, view of the general fund appropriations comparing fiscal year 18 to fiscal year 19. Um, the budget, primarily because of the three-eighths tax that, you, that was passed, will grow by 44.5 million. Once again, this is just the general fund. You can see in this table we do have some changes, some pretty significant changes between departments. Um, those are mostly driven by uh, reorganizations, and we'll talk about some of those as we get to um, the individual departments. If we look at just the general fund once again, you can see police and fire make up nearly 48% of the overall budget. Um, all other departments are about 53%. So police at 33% of appropriations and fire at 14%. Other highlights in this budget is uh, 5.2 million for the city's portion of the increase in the employer contribution toward health care, um, compensation as we've talked about, the increase is about 2% for most employees, 1% to offset the increased in health care premiums, and then 1% COLA. Um, compensations higher than 2%, as Ms. Nair mentioned, will be targeted in negotiations for certain unions. We have uh, 3.6 million uh, to restore the risk recovery and half a million for facilities coming online, including Los Altos Pool and North Domingo Baca Gym. <clears throat> we do have two million in for the National Senior Games, which will take place at the tail end of fiscal year 19. We have 1.2 million in municipal development for various positions, including a regional transportation management center um, a sidewalk ADA coordinator, and agency coordination for storm drainage. 1.1 million, 1 .1 million for an increase in the subsidy to the gas tax road fund. 300,000 to address the uh, latest increase in the minimum wage, which is something we hadn't been addressing in recent budgets, but that's slowly been creeping up, and we do have some, uh, did have some compression issues, so we are addressing that primarily in uh, family and community services and parks. We do have an increase in the subsidy for golf of 349000 and a $3.9 million reserve to add a growth class uh, of police officers in the coming year. In addition to the increase of 3 eighths gross uh, of one cent in GRT, we do have an additional 710,000 proposed uh, from fee increases at various venues across the city. We have uh, Albuquerque Museum and the Balloon Museum entrance. We expect to generate an additional 137,000 from those increases. There's a special exhibit entrance at the Albuquerque Museum, uh, Museum of 200, uh, we expect to generate about 250,000 and uh, the director will talk about that when we get to that slide. Um, senior centers, adult memberships, uh, we're proposing an increase of $5, which we expect to generate $100,000. Family and community services will implement a new adult membership fee. Um, we're working that out and we'll talk about that on those uh, individual departments as well. 
we expect that to generate about 64 million. Increase in uh, erosion and sediment control plan fees generating 14,000. Inspection uh, for stormwater control expected to raise 44,000. And finally, lean processing fees, 101,000. So here's a list of the departments uh, up tonight. They're not in alphabetical order. We're gonna uh, sort of tackle the big ones first. And uh, like I mentioned, Madam Chair, uh, we'll go ahead and, and do police first, and then we'll call uh, the chief up to stand for questions. So the police general fund budget is proposed at 190 million, 162,000. There are 1,560 positions that include sworn and civilian. Um, the fiscal year 19 budget increases by 19.6 million and includes the following. There's an increased recruitment and retention effort through pay incentives, which we've talked a little bit about. Uh, reinstating uh, recurring and additional funding to comply with the Department of Justice settlement agreement and to ensure timely and proper imp implementation of all the reforms. There's recurring funding now for the property crime reduction program. It was non-recurring in the current year and we've added an additional eight uh, positions. Those would be classified the PSA two positions as you're aware. There's also funding to address the sexual assault uh, kit and latent fingerprint uh, backlog. This includes funding for four new positions in police. And there's additional support staff to assist at 911, uh, the call center. Um, there's also positions to process cases and get them ready for the district attorney's office to ensure um, more successful prosecution of criminals and also uh, the implementation of, of community policing. And lastly, in police, we have uh, a highlight of one-time funding of $4 million for vehicle uh, replacement, as Mr. Bakta mentioned earlier. So with that, Madam Chair, I'll go ahead and, and call up uh, Chief Geyer. We have several people uh, in the audience that can answer questions that maybe uh, I can't answer or the Chief can't answer. So. Thank you, Mr. Romero. Chief Geyer, welcome this evening. Counselors, are there any questions? Let's start with Counselor Davis. Chief, good evening. Thanks so much good good evening, for being Counselor. here. I know we have a set aside for a new uh, in reserve for a new police class or a, what a bumper class, whatever we're going to call it. Do you know when that class expects to be filled and seated so that, you know, will you need the full 3-9 for the full year? When, when do you expect that to come on, those officers to actually come online? Well, obviously, we're in the finishing stages of that recruitment process. I yes, believe sir. we have, we're shooting for a goal of 50, where we have a number of qualified candidates already seated. I think it's in the amount of 33, 34. I can get you those exact figures. Um, and with a number of qualified candidates that are still in various stages of the, either the background or testing process itself. Um, that class, I believe, is in the middle of June, is when they'll be actually started. Um, so that's the best I can do. The other class that we have right now in session graduates uh, May 24th, I believe. Thanks, sir. Thank you, Counselor. Thank you, Counselor Sanchez. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, Chief, the proposed budget is going to be $190,162,000, which is an, is an increase of $19.6 million. Based on the number of uh, officers that we're going to hire, police officers that we're going to hire, it's saying 1,040 police officers. Are we going to be able to get to that number this fiscal year? And there's also called the FTEs that are in there, and they're saying that's gonna be 6%, so that reduces that number by about 62 officers. But my concern is we raised taxes to assure the public that we were going to try to keep Albuquerque safe and that we were going to hire police officers for, the, uh, for this coming fiscal year and the next two or three fiscal years. Are we gonna be able to attain the numbers in this coming fiscal year to 1,040 minus the FTEs of 62? Madam Chair, Councilor Sanchez, uh, our goal is a, a part of a long-term plan, obviously a four-year plan. I think the, fit, the projections that we are looking for is we're at 880 now, we'd like to be at 980, 1,000 at the end of the fiscal year, this fiscal year, uh, 19. Uh, obviously I can't make guarantees because we 
have classes that start with 50 and end with 25. In some cases, uh, people drop out or are uh, eliminated from the process. Uh, but our goal is to do that. I think with um, a good contract um, with the city, with the APOA, uh, I think with efforts, the new recruitment efforts that we have, uh, which include uh, the retention bonuses and a potential referral bonus program. I think with other efforts in terms of trying to find pipelines in, in the community, even starting younger as uh, some of the younger uh, we have with the public safety initiatives, we're going to be mentoring and working with young kids as well. We're proposing an Explorer Scout program. Uh, we're in the process right now of developing a, a satellite academy uh, with CNM, uh, getting that approved through the Department of Public Safety. And what that would do is give us an opportunity. Um, obviously, our academy is now 28 weeks. So to run two academies in one year actually goes over that the calendar year period. Um, what that would do is be able to get people into the system early, uh, say the first 16 weeks of the, the academy in the satellite process. And we would be able to take them at that point for the next 10 weeks. Conceivably, we could run four of those academies in the, the upcoming years once that started. Um, it's very optimistic. Uh, we have a good number of people that I think will come in as laterals. Uh, we've changed a little bit of the, you know, the efforts in terms of uh, trying to attract laterals, recruiting them with different incentives. Uh, and just with the, the status of the department, I think the culture has changed so that uh, people are willing to come back to APD. Um, before, in the last couple of years, we've heard comments to the effect that even APD officers didn't recommend their family members to be part of APD. They recommend that they go to other departments. That has changed. I think we're going to see more people coming in. Uh, we've already seen that. We've seen an increase of laterals this year, even well and above what they received all of last year. So something's changing. Uh, again, Counselor, I, I want to be hopelessly optimistic as best I can. I, I think that we're bringing uh, a new avenue to the department that will, again, increase that staffing and will also, at the top end, will retain more people as well, which is a, a part of the goal. And one of the things that this council did in the previous budget is we increased the number of PSA 1s and also the PSA 2s. I can see the number is increasing for the PSA 2s, but not the PSA 1s. And the, your PSA 1s are those individuals that will become Albuquerque police officers that will work their way into the police department. Are we going to look at increasing or keeping those numbers the same for PSA 1s? We'd like to. I, I think they were reduced, and I can check with our budget people. I know the, the transfer of the PSA 1s uh, that we're not going to have, you know, asked for this year were transferred to the PSA 2 so that we can in, maintain that. I, part of that was the recurring. We asked for those additional numbers for that. The PSA 2 program, it's not part of the pipeline directly. Obviously, PS, the PSAs are the ones that are going through it. In this current class, we have several, the, you know, for example, uh, Counselor. Um, we'd like to, but I don't think it was a, a priority figure right now. We have a pretty good number of PSAs. Uh, as we look to expand the program, I think that will be an initiative we will pursue. And one more question. I, I like a lot of things that are incorporated into, into this budget, but also looking at laterals uh, that we're trying to recruit are we going to have the incentive program available for those laterals in year one, or are we going to wait? I'm going to defer that because that adds to a contractual issue. That's, uh, in, in <laughs> <laughs> Madam Chair, uh, Councillor Sanchez. Yes, please. Um, short answer is yes. Of course, we are not at liberty to discuss the details of the negotiations at this point, but there is um, going to be a form of uh, pay that will be directed towards lateral recruitment as well as retention of folks in that sort of 18 year range where we're seeing folks leave right now. And uh, also the referral bonus program that we're proposing that is outside of the contract that would be available to anybody in the city, uh, city government who makes a referral of somebody who uh, actually gets through and becomes a sworn officer could apply to laterals as well. So we definitely understand the need to target laterals in addition to new recruits. Um, also, the way that we've structured the funding in the budget, there's a, sort of that $3.9 million reserve uh, for 40 new additional officers. Those are really targeted at new recruits because that's sort of what they're priced at. But the other money for the other officers are at all different levels because they're the vacancies, essentially. And so that gives us the capacity within in, in the budget that we've proposed to bring on laterals in addition to new recruits. And basically, of the $45.5 million that we are going to generate in revenues with the tax increase, 
that equates to about 43 or 44.5% of that money going to the Albuquerque Police Department. Is that correct? Uh, Madam Chair, Councillor Sanchez, that is correct. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Sanchez. Uh, Councillor Gibson, you have a question? Yes, yes uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm uh, s still looking at that uh, last bullet point, the 3.9 million reserved for the uh, growth class. Can you give me an idea of where that What's in that 3.9 million? Madam Chair, Councillor Gibson, I think I refer that as well to the CAO. Sure. Uh, okay. Yeah. yeah. So, um, Madam Chair, Councillor Gibson, that is essentially um, the cost of 40 new officers hired at a like a just recent recruit level, and so that salaries then. You that's mean? right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Salaries and benefits. Right. Yes, it's, yeah. it's assuming $28 an hour plus fringe benefits and a reserve. Okay. All right, well, and, and thank you for adding that second class, that uh, growth class. It's really important to do that. Also, how are we um, uh, recruiting for, for new hires? I know you talked a little bit uh, 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 about laterals, and I have seen billboard, or more than one billboard, north of, uh, uh, north of the city on I-25, but uh, are there any other things that we're doing to recruit? Madam Chair, Councilor Gibson, yes, we are. Um, we have a new recruitment strategy. We reviewed, uh, did a study with, with the city in terms of um, where we're losing people. Uh, we get a lot of interest on, online. Our line is our best bet right now to, to reach out to the, in this a day and age of social media, that's where most of the candidates will, will first get acquainted to the Albuquerque Police Department. Um, from there, we're looking at a recruitment video. Uh, we're looking at uh, actually off-site testing, going to areas. We know there's parts of the country right now where uh, there's not many jobs for police officer candidates, especially in areas where they have satellite um, academies that young, uh, young men and women are going through, coming out and there's no jobs. We're gonna be focusing on targets like that. Uh, we always will continue focusing on military, especially as they're exiting or uh, turn their exit uh, interviews of their own careers. Uh, we'll, we'll be doing off-site testing, which will help with out-of-state candidates. And then obviously all the, the basic job fairs and uh, trying to deal with the local colleges, especially like I said, our partnership with CNM is critical to that. Um, that's a big pipeline, but even going further with the explorers, we're, we're talking in high school and making that presence so that we can keep those people as good candidates. Mm -hmm. So. That's the bottom end with recruiting is that's the many, many areas of pipelines that we're gonna try to, you know, kind of reach out to as many avenues as we can. Okay, thank you. You know, I've, I've, I've said before several times and I'd really love to see us put more energy into recruit, recruiting from college campuses. You know, whether they, probably giving a preference to wherever they offer criminology degrees or something of that like, but, uh, even a liberal arts um, uh, college or university starting in the state of New Mexico or maybe regionally, but um, that's how other places do it. And, Corporations. It's part of the strategy. Obviously, uh, the criminal justice programs in New Mexico with partnerships with you know the state university and UNM, which is right here, are crucial. But we know that there's criminal justice programs in surrounding states too that are pipelined to other other agencies mm -hmm. that, uh, again, we can't just deal with local. The, the candidate pool here is limited, obviously, not just in the city, but in the state. So you, you're absolutely right, Councilor, I agree with you, is to kind of broaden. And we will actually go out there and do testing out there, which would make the process easier, rather than have a candidate make several trips to this. So we can get a two-day testing process where our people go out off-site and conduct that testing. They may only have to come back and make one trip before they make a final decision. Right, right. So there's, and I'm sure you, you've seen, I'm sure there have been lots of studies, but I'm most familiar, familiar with, the, with the one that was done at University of Michigan where they showed that even a, a little tiny bit of college uh, experience makes a big difference in um, the uh, uh, of police officers' uh, likelihood for success. And... Um, so we know where they get that education. We've got maps. Thank you. Thank you. 
Excuse me, Madam Chair, may I make a correction to an answer I gave earlier? Yes, you may. Um, sorry, pardon the interruption. Uh, Councillor Sanchez, you asked about the percentage to APD. I got a little numeric dyslexia. It's actually 54%, not 45%. Thank you. And that's just to police, correct? Yes, 25.5 to Albuquerque Police. Thank you, Councillor. And one more. Uh, Councillor uh, Benjamin, you have a question of the Chief? Yes, uh, Chief. Um, so recognizing, you know, recruiting is highly competitive, right? Uh, uh, I like what I'm hearing from you about some of your ideas of, of going to these areas where, sadly, perhaps they're in decline and they've got people who want to be officers, so that sounds great. But um, the, the, uh, the question I had uh, had to do with, with just the last few classes. As I recall, in each class, we get a nice big group of people who are interested and even get through the uh, vetting process of the city. But what's the number that, that graduate on the average? As Just correct me if I'm wrong, I've always seen it to be somewhere between 30 and 40 max, right? Yes, it depends on the class size. I can't give you in recent yeah. years. I know the, the, the class sizes have varied, but. Yeah, we, we usually, oh. there'll be some that you get into the academy and a few weeks in kind of get second thoughts about whether this is a career they want. Sure. Um, we also get the few, that, and very few, I think there's a lesser number with the mentality in the academy now is it's not so much to, you know, break them down and build them up, you know, military style. <laughs> it's actually to develop them, mentor them, and encourage them and guide them through the successful, not just the academy, but continuation throughout their careers. So I think you see less of the ones that, but I know we just recently had one that, uh, definitely was having some issues. It doesn't mean that they won't be a good officer, but I think there may be some times that they just, they're not ready right now at this time in their life. And so we'll lose a couple that way. But I think if I was just to give a ballpark figure is that we're, we're losing less people from our academies. In my day, a class of 50 may have graduated 35. I think now a class of, of we, I think we've only lost one or two from this current class. I think the numbers are going to be significantly less. Plus, we're also finding ways that we can put them in, uh, you know, pre-hire positions so that they're ready, getting ready for the academy before. Because we do have people that come to uh, a testing process and they're not physically fit, and and that's one of the you know areas that we can change that in a maybe a period of 10 to 12 weeks before. So, we're doing everything we can to keep what we get. It's 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 not a matter that we're getting so many that we can sacrifice you know, 10%, 20%. So I can't give you an exact figure, Council Pentler, Penton, I'm sorry, but it, it's looking better, I can say that. That's good to hear. Yeah, so just speaking about that 10%, um, have we looked at all at, a, at adjust, adjustment of some of our standards with regard to minor prior infractions by applicants? Well, n yes and no, Council Pentland. I think that um, in some areas, and I know that Councilor Gibson referred to college, that we're, we're definitely one of the reasons we're looking at this satellite uh, program is that they will get their college education as part of the academy and as part of the, the pre-academy with the, um, the satellite 16 weeks. So they'll come in ready with two, two uh, years of college. I think that we also, as part of our career development program, we're encouraging continuing education. So I think that um, you know, we're, we're in that right direction to try to ensure that that's going to happen. I'm not sure I answered your question, though, completely. Oh, well, just talking about, you know, uh, I know that, that it's somewhat been in the news in the past about, uh, say, for something like a minor possession of marijuana, just as an example, all right, that type of infraction, uh, that disqualifies somebody from applying, right? Yeah, and, and yes, Councilor Bentler, uh, Madam Chair and Councilor Bentland, we, um, we're looking at some of the standards right now. Obviously, we have some standards that probably won't be flexible. But when we did the studies, we, we saw where we're losing most of the people. And some of them are in the initial entry testing, whether it's the written test, um, a good deal are in the areas of um, the physical fitness. Again, these are areas that we can have them retest and get back in the system fairly quickly. Where we have the biggest problems is when we do the background. And like you said, is it's part of that is a, uh, a pre-questionnaire that deals with integrity that's followed up with you know, psychological and polygraph and medical. Uh, some of those standards, like medical standards and things like that, we can't change. But what we're looking at right now is we're having a review at the top uh, with the chief selection process that actually looks at some of those candidates that are being subjectively disqualified for, say, uh, 
on a polygraph where there's, it's not a, a matter of they, well, they've passed or failed, but it's a matter of it was in question or uh, they couldn't come up with a decision. There's also areas, same thing with the psychologists, we're reviewing to make sure that we're not dismissing people based on, say, one person's opinion. We're trying to take another look at that. So we're trying to, to do that. But the standards that you refer to uh, as far as time frames for like DWI arrest, felony arrest, uh, drug arrest, uh, I know you mentioned marijuana. We, we still have those standards in place. Mm -hmm. But again, this is a different society than it was 10 years ago or when I started on the job. I mean, we don't have height and weight requirements, things like that anymore. So could they change? Yes. Uh, we will have to look at that in terms of we don't want to lower standards either and then get somebody that's going to be problematic down the road. Thank you. And Madam Chair, just real quickly. Uh, so again, it's, it's highly competitive. The whole, the whole deal with laterals really, I, I guess I see it as, as very similar to us trying to attract economic development or us trying to attract tourism or our uh, uh, doing good planning that makes the place look good and, and, and uh, feel good as a place to live because uh, police officers are, are uh, residents too and um, we've got so much to offer and somehow coalescing all of that uh, not only for economic development and so forth, but, but uh, for recruitment of, of, uh, of good public uh, safety officials and servants would be a well, great and, way to go. Yes, and Madam, or, uh, Madam Chair and Councilor Benton, one of the things is we, we're going to start targeting people during the summer because that's when after graduation, you know, people all over are looking for jobs, especially college graduates. But we're going to use some tactics using our own economic situation here is you go to some like last winter in the East Coast, uh, I imagine a lot of people that are looking to be police jobs don't want to work in 12 feet of snow or cold below freezing. We can use the, the, you know, the climate and some of the benefits and low cost of living compared to different parts of the country. When we go out to these sites, to use that as selling points too. So we are part of the, as they mentioned earlier, we're part of the big, bigger city picture too and we know police impact that and so we can attract people that way as well. Good to hear, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Borrego, I want to ask, uh, Councillor Pena has a pertinent question here first. Councillor Pena. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so I just had a question, it may be for Sarita, but um, you know, I was working with the prior administration just based on what Councillor Benton was saying about the um, small possessions of marijuana. So um, my concern was a lot of um, young um, um, minorities were actually being ex excluded and and across the board, but they were being excluded because of the the possessions of, of marijuana. But I was told at the time that they were referring to the state statute, and through the work that had been done, um, the state statute they were saying here um, locally we were saying that the state statute read um, for. Um, um, possession, but it actually reads for convictions. So talking to the prior administration, they were actually um, meeting with the folks from the state to get clarification from that in order to change it because um, what was determined was that we were reading the state statute wrong. Madam Chair, Councilor Pena, there's a good point there. Uh, I think the state, the DPS, that kind of mandate some of this, but each, each community here has their own standards. Um, I think with marijuana possession, I know we've just made it a civil penalty for small amount. I don't think that's as much as the issue is the, the recency of consumption or the amount of consumption uh, over the years. I mean, I think that we pretty much find there isn't too many candidates here that haven't experimented with marijuana. If we eliminated, we would probably have no candidates in the future. But I think you're, you're on track with as far as changing that particular standard, mm -hmm. obviously the hardcore drugs and addictive drugs, we, we probably have no, well, no wiggle room there, but I, I think there are some areas, I mean, again, same standards with uh, alcohol use and things like that. It's not a matter of that they drink or they have possession of alcohol. We get a few that have minor in possession charges. They grow up, get out of college, and they, they're very responsible. But if they're still drinking and drinking heavily, that's going to impact on, on the quality of the, the police officer candidate. So some of these standards are subjective, but I think you're on track as if it's based on state law or some type of state mandate through the DPS in terms of what would be highly recommended, or even national standards, we'd be more than willing to look into that. At this point, I can't answer what previous administration did or even where we're, we're going to go with this because we're still in a flux. 
Madam, Madam Chair. If I could just follow up with that. So I'd like to sit down and meet. Maybe we can sit down and go over some of the information that, that I have currently because I, I was told, because there's lots of kids, I've received calls, constituents that, you know, that especially from, from the area, we had a lot, we had a, a job fair um, for police recruitment in um, at Atrisco Heritage, and a lot of those um, students or, or young men and women were actually being excluded because of that, and I received all those calls. So I started this whole discussion, and what I was told is that we had to follow state statute, and that at the end of the day, through all those discussions, is that we were eating it wrong. So I'd like to sit down and just and meet, because I, I think that's something that we really need to look at. I think it's a, it's a, <laughs> I guess Rita wanted to say something. Ms. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, Councillor Pena, uh, we agree, and there, it's not just the, the marijuana, but also there's the credit check, there is the literacy and numeracy requirements. We see that we're losing candidates at each one of those stages. And in some cases, the answer might be that we might lose them for that class, but we shouldn't lose contact with them over the long run. If we can connect them with resources that'll help them rehabilitate their credit for the look back period, if we can help them connect with an adult education program, if we can stay in touch with them so when that three or five year look back on the marijuana uh, possession goes away, we, we still know who they are and if they still wanna be a police, we can have them join the force. And, and also looking at using the PSA programs as a way to stay connected to those folks who have expressed interest. And so um, we are working with APD on, on all of those issues and kind of reevaluating in that light. And um, I'd be happy to facilitate a meeting with the, the chief and others on that. And Madam Chair, if I could add just a bit to that. We're definitely um, striving for diversity, Council Pena, um, and as part of that early intervention is, is we can reach out to those young, young kids and kind of explain to them how when you go to college, it's student loans and credit cards sometimes will cause problems later in life. Um, sometimes that party, partying, certain things that they do can actually bar them later. I know we put the restrictions in terms of you know, do not apply you if you have done this, but I think that this is definitely an area where we can attract more candidates. And again, it's not so much those issues as, as it is we look for uh, you know, different types of characteristics, and integrity, uh, service orientation, some of their own you know, accomplishments in their life, and then their, their, their overall maturity. Those are more important in terms of success as a police officer than, say, a mistake that they made when they were 17 or 18. And so I, I, I agree with you, and I would welcome also being part of that meeting. And our academy uh, direct, or, um, commander, the, the director of the academy, is here as well, and I'm sure he would want to be part of that. Councilor Pena, yeah. and then Councilor Thank you, Madam Rigo. Chair, I apologize for that. But just one last comment is that I, you know, I agree, Sarita, you know, providing them the resources to, to help with, um, you know, if they have um, bad credit that we don't want to lose and we want to maintain contact. But, you know, one of the challenges that we do have is when we look at those things in, in a strict way, you actually, you know, um, not getting through the class because you have bad credit, it's a challenge and it's a hurdle for, for people um, who experience poverty, um, you know, that tends to be um, an issue. So um, it, it's to no fault of their own and I just think that, you know, maybe through the initial process we could work to try to help these folks. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Borrego. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and thank you, Chief Geyer, for the work that you and APD do and the fire department also. I know it's very difficult. And we're sort of all in this sort of mess together. And, you know, I kind of see it as a community as coming together and not just the, pri the public sector. And I think we're all trying to do our part in the public sector, but we also need the private sector to work with this. Um, Two questions. One is with regard to um, the budget, and sort of back to the budget, um, is, you know, what assurance do we have, um, I guess, and maybe this also goes to Sarita um, and, the, and the administration, is how do we have benchmarks in place to know that we are actually moving forward to achieve what it is that we're saying that we're trying to achieve? Um, I mean, are we looking at things sort of, you know, in the next two months, in the next four months? Do we have benchmarks in place that will 
alert you if something, a strategy is not working, then we maybe tweak our strategy or, um, so I mean, I guess that's the question that I'm asking is what are the benchmarks that you all have in place? Well, and there's four priority areas that I think I can kind of categorize as that would fall into that. Now we actually are doing a, a type of a work plan with the city right now where we have to outline that as directors. But from the police department in general, obviously you, you're looking at the issues of crime, we're looking at the issues of retention and recruitment as we've talked, uh, counselor, and um, also community policing initiatives, uh, as well as the CASA and those So we have qualifying factors that we would look at in the next maybe two months, three I, months, four months, five, I mean. Yes, ma'am, I think there's performance measures. I mean, with crime, obviously we're gonna do quarterly um, revealing of where we're at in terms of the property crime and violence crime. So those should be pretty self-evident. Uh, community policing, uh, it, it, the process will be underway. Some of that will be subjective because we're, we're developing different pillars in different areas, but I think some, some performance benchmarks may be how many people we engage in that and then what services are provided or what kind of partnerships are developed. I think recruitment and retention will kind of speak for itself. There should be some raw data there, uh, you know, in, in and, I, and I think all of us up here will be looking for those benchmarks and, and sort of regular maybe reporting that we are trying to achieve and meeting those goals. May, may I, Madam Chair? Uh, Madam Chair, uh, Councillor Borrego, I think what you'll see ha that we've already put in place and will continue to expand is increased transparency in what's going on in the police department, not just for the councillors, but for the entire city. And so um, from the data portal, from the public release of crime stats to uh, updates on recruitment, we want the whole city to know because this is the number one concern that we hear from all of our citizens and, and everyone who's um, paying that extra tax deserves to know that their money is being put to the, to the purposes we said it would. So absolutely, that is the plan. I very much appreciate that. My second question, or maybe really isn't even a question, but maybe it's an sort of encouragement because I don't see it in here, but I'm sure you guys are probably looking at it, is involving the private sector in um, helping to uh, re, you know, maintain our police force. And in the past, and I know this for a fact, is um, there were, you know, um, and this goes back to Councillor Pena's concern about credit worthiness, um, some officers maybe, you know, they were given uh, uh, assistance in finding homes. And, and you know, I, I guess I'm sort of reaching out to the public tonight a little bit, especially to the private sector, is what are strategies that we could use as a city to help encourage both officers and firefighters to choose that profession. And in, in the past, I, I remember that um, you know, they were offered incentives with, you know, their, their mortgages and, and things that would help. So I hope that we're looking at that angle as well and strategies that would assist in, you know, bringing our community together and, and really all of us working in, in to have more officers on the street. Madam Chair, Councilor Borrego, we, with community policing, that's exactly what we're doing. Um, we're reaching out to the, the private sectors, even clergy and whatever, because those people can reach out within their communities and with their areas of expertise and, and encourage young people, uh, help support some of our programs in that regard. And I think that that's part of that outreach that we're looking for is, I mean, I, I think our best salespeople are our own officers. When they go out there in the community, engage in non-enforcement activity, represent the community more so as an oppressing force, but it actually has been in partnership. And, and you know, when I, when I say that, I'm really looking to the banking industry and, you know, how they can help. I mean, not just the banking industry, but, you know, retail and, and other things that can offer incentives to help maintain these officers to stay in our community. So thank you all for everything that you're doing and, you know, hopefully, we're gonna get over this hurdle. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Borrego. Uh, Councilor Harris. Uh, thank you. Uh, Chief, could you explain what is the 
credit um, worthiness or how does that, uh, what does an officer have to do or what, what's the issue that you're concerned about with, with regard to credit? I may have to defer that to the director of the academy that deals with recruiting. Um, if I can refer, defer that counselor to sure. speak Commander Sullivan, he's the director. Good evening, Cam Commander. You, it's your lucky day. Good evening. <laughs> lucky, right? <laughs> Good evening. Um, Councilman, um, Councilor um, Harris, you had the question, correct, sir? Yes. Uh, what, what are the criteria for credit worthiness that would uh, or could be used to exclude a, a cadet? Right. Good, good, good question. We don't have like an exact number, like, you know, a 600 or whatever on your credit rating. What we do is we look at an overall credit score, an overall payment history, just to show financial responsibility. So it is a little bit subjective, I'll be honest with you. And in my time as the academy director, and I used to do chief's selection prior to that, I've never actually experienced uh, releasing a candidate based on the credit worthiness alone. You know, if we saw that combined with several other things that would be red flags, but usually we're just looking for a pattern of responsible financial independence. We're hoping that the candidate doesn't have several outstanding write-offs to bad debt and things like that, because the ultimate fear would be, of course, as a police officer, you're entrusted by the community and you're supposed to be, you know, above that and a pillar of the community. I don't want to send out an officer who could potentially be tempted to do something unethical or even illegal. So, because one of the ways that I've seen in, in, um, in my profession also is that uh, with regard to security clearances, a lot of times they'll actually encourage people to file bankruptcy because then they have zero debt and then they're not subject to temptation, which I think is what you're talking about, right? Right. We wouldn't get that in depth with it, to be honest with you. And I, I know because I have a security clearance, so I, I kind of understand what you're talking about. But a, a bankruptcy wouldn't necessarily be a pro or a con thing. Debt having debt is okay and we understand that and I, I sit through hundreds of cadets over the last few years and it's it's good to see that you have a house or a car and you're making your payments on it that's fine we've even accepted candidates who had some write-offs due to due to poor debt it's if we see a massive history of an individual who's not clearly not paying their bills and is living outside their means you know you you see somebody who works at a you know a restaurant for example but they're driving a hundred thousand dollar automobile we're probably going to ask them how are you paying for that automobile you know and they may say my, my parents helped me okay that's great that, that's fine we're it's usually more something that we're going to ask for explanation on and just kind of if fine-tune it a little bit i can tell you with absolute certainty i'm i at least in my experience and going forward if i'm still the academy director i'm not going to you know, eliminate a candidate just based purely on financial issues, unless it's just so egregious that. So that's not really a big, a bar to getting into the academy is. No, it's just it's just one of them, but it's certainly and it's usually like I said, it's going to be that, and we're also going to see significant drug use, or we're going to see you know, they've had 15 jobs in the last two months, so we're kind of you know wondering is this person really here for the long term? The goal is to hire somebody as an employee of the city of Albuquerque and the Albuquerque Police Department for 25 years. We, the biggest issue we've had, and the chief kind of alluded to it, is we're hiring folks. They're going through what is one of the highest rated academies in the nation, and they're leaving. Because they're taking our training, and then they're going somewhere else. So that's one of my qualifiers. Is I want to I make sure that you're not just going to take my, my training program and go to another city. It, it, it get, it's competitive. We want to we wanna keep them here. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Commander. Thank you, Chief. Uh, Mr. Romero, I think that's it, Chief, unless you have a statement you'd like to make. No, I'm very honored to be here and representing the department, and we appreciate your continuing support. Thank you all. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Romero, that's one down. One down. <laughs> <laughs> I think the big guns are down. Madam Chair, uh, next up is fire with uh, Paul Dow as chief. The proposed general fund budget for the fire department is $82.9 million. They have 730 full-time equivalent positions. Um, the proposed budget for fiscal year 19, the mayor's proposed budget includes 3.1 million to implement the mobile integrated healthcare and community outreach program. This program will include 19 new full-time positions. There's also an increase of 555,000 for internal service costs, technical adjustments um, associated with uh, risk 
fleet and communications. And so with that, I'll turn it over to Chief. Good evening, Chief Dow. Are there any questions of the Chief? Madam Chair, the Councilors, thank you. Thank you, Chief. We appreciate Oops. it. You're excused. <laughs> Mr. Romero. <laughs> Madam Mr. Chair, Romero. Uh, next up is Family and Community Services. Um, we do have a, a memo uh, to, um, in response to, I believe it was council question number six regarding social service contracts. Um, we're submitting to you, and I think we have a handout um, clarifying our response a little bit. Um, The question from council was provide a list of fiscal year 18 social service contracts that are not being renewed in fiscal year 19 and a justification for the termination. Also, will other organizations or city departments be performing these services instead? And I don't believe we did an adequate job of answering it the first time, so this is just to add to your binders, counselors, and feel free to look at it and follow up with questions of uh, Director Pierce. Family and Community Services has a general fund proposed budget of $39.9 million. There are 201 positions funded out of the general fund. The proposed budget includes $18 million uh, for various social service contracts and professional and technical contracts. There's half a million to expand um, and or provide new youth programs, uh, also aimed sort of fitting in with the public safety um, initiative from all angles of counselors. There's 150,000 for the creation of two full-time supervisor positions and temporary wages to support the reopening of Dennis Chavez and Pat Hurley Community Centers. Uh, we've created mid-year in the current fiscal year three deputy directors that will be focusing on homelessness and affordable housing strategies, on educational initiatives, and on health um, and or behavioral health programs. Madam Chair, would you like, uh, are there any questions for the director before I embarrass the next director and have them come up <laughs> with no questions? Thank you, Mr. Romero. Councilors, do you have any questions of, um, of Director Pierce? Yes, uh, Councilor Benton. Good evening, Director. Good evening. Good evening, Madam Director. Um, Probably going to have some other questions that we'll uh, send to you written, but um, the one that, that I had uh, was heading home. Mm -hmm. My understanding over the years is that we've always been playing catch up with the demand for heading home versus our capacity, and that was part of the reason last year that the council did appropriate an extra 400000 to heading home. Do you know where they're at in terms of their what the latent, latent need is out there for heading home? Or could someone speak to that? Let me call on staff if we know. Lisa, uh, Lisa do you want to come on up? And with this, I'd like to introduce one of our new deputy directors, Lisa Huval, with Housing and Homelessness. I think I recognize Good her. Good evening, deputy oh. director. Budget hearing. Thank you, thank you, Madam Chair and Councillor Benton. Um, you know, I can't, I cannot speak to the Albuquerque Heading Home Initiative specifically, but in terms of some community-wide data about homelessness and where we're at, some of you know we have a, um, a coordinated entry system that we're now using to fill all city and HUD-funded um, homeless programs, and we have about 5,000 people in our coordinated entry system. So these are folks that are currently homeless or have um, really severe housing instability that are looking for supportive housing. And I don't have the exact numbers off the top of my head, but I, I would guess that you know we probably have about 100 openings in our um, supportive housing programs for homeless folks each month. So you can see the need versus the supply. 
Um, so, you know, I think heading home is a piece of that, and then there's lots of other um, permanent supportive housing programs as well. So there is really, you know. Yeah, I'm kind of picking a, a that out just because yeah. it's right there in front. Yeah. And and uh, yeah, as I recall, when uh, when that program was started out under the previous administration, they started out with about a half a million a year, and uh, and we, uh, you know, we did get up above north of a million, uh, and and that. That need seemed to be absorbed uh, quickly in and of itself. So, uh, just wanted to touch base on that and welcome. I, I think Thank it's you. it's great to have you on board with the city. Glad to be here. Thank you. Thank you, ladies. Are there any other questions? Thank you very much, Director. You're welcome, Mr. Romero. Madam Chair, next up is cultural services. Um, we also have another handout here before we start this slide, counselors. Um, as we mentioned earlier, um, this is in a memo format. There's been some um, questions about the special events money that was appropriated and is generally appropriated year after year. In the fiscal year 19 budget, uh, 18 budget, uh, um, we had about 633,000 um, allocated in non-recurring funding within cultural services for special events. So this would be the, um, this would be you know, Cesar Chavez Celebration, Flamenco Ensemble. We, we, contractors like that, that we generally call out because it is one-time money. In fiscal year 19's projected uh, revenue stream, we didn't have a lot of non-recurring revenue. So, we, what we decided to do was um, allocate sort of a general pot of money of 400000 within cultural services um, and to allow the counselors to decide um, which of these contractors they would include in the uh, final budget that you adopt on the 21st. Since that time, um, it's clear that it, the 400000 was not enough, and uh, I've been instructed, and I think we have a plan now to um, find another 233,000 so that we can at least have enough funding to match what we had in the fiscal year 18 budget. So I'll be working with council staff here in the next uh, few days and, uh, and we'll work out an amendment to add back the funding to the equivalent amount of fiscal year 18. So that long-winded answer is what's summarized in that memo. Thank you, Mr. Romero. Sure. Uh, counselors, do you have any questions of uh, Director Sanchez? There are no questions Madam? of Director. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Counselor Sanchez. Uh, thank you, um, Madam Chairman. Uh, my question is in regards to the uh, proposed deletion of non-recurring revenues for the Alameda Library. And you're looking at bringing in a new position, a full-time media public outreach coordinator for special events. What is the cost of that uh, public media relations outreach for special events? And what is it going to cost us to close? And what are we going to gain by closing the Alamosa Library? Thank you. Uh, Councillor Sanchez, would you like to have Director Sanchez answer that question? Uh, Madam Chair, Councillor like Sanchez, I think I can, uh, in can general whatever terms, answer it. Okay. Um, as you know, Councillor um, Alameda, uh, Al Alamosa, I'm sorry, library uh, has been funded for the past three years with non-recurring money. In fact, in the 18 budget, it was even a smaller amount as we went from, I think, four positions down to three. Um, once again, it was non-recurring money funding that. We did not have a lot of non-recurring revenue, and, uh, and so it, was, it is one of the proposed deletions um, in the department. We're working with Family and Community Services to possibly um, look at a different use of that space. Uh, I mean, assuming the council, the council adopts the budget the way it was proposed. Um, and so it would be something that would allow for programming after school, um, tutoring or something of in, in the, that line to continue uh, services to kids in that space that uh, we know how it's used. So. And with regard to the position, um, 52,000 is what the position's funded at, Councillor. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? 
Okay, Mr. Romero. I won't hit the highlights in this fund, but they've been up on the screen for a bit. It's a $39 million general fund budget with 350 positions. Civilian police oversight is uh, funded at 1,087,000. There are eight positions. Um, the increase is mainly technical for uh, tort and other claims that were assigned to this department. As you know, by ordinance, we have to fund uh, this department at least at one half percent of the appropriated appropriation for the police department, and we are in excess of that. And I'm not sure uh, Director Harness is here tonight. Oh, are there any questions for the director? Thank you, Mr. Romero. Any questions? Not at this time. Thank you, Mr. Harness. Excuse me. Economic development. Um, Cynthia Jaramillo is the director. The proposed general fund budget is $4.3 million with 11 positions. Um, the budget includes continued funding for uh, economic development investments of 150,000, uh, transit-oriented development corridors for 125,000, small business development at 55,000, and listen ABQ at 30,000. Madam Chair, are there any questions for Director Jaramillo? Thank you. Councilors, any questions? I don't think so. Thank you, Ms. Wait, wait. Yes, uh, Councilor Benton. Uh, Mr. Romero, in the past, um, we funded uh, the Borellis Main Street, the South Forest Street uh, Main Street, which was uh, which remains uh, in formation, and we had funded that at uh, forty thousand dollars the past couple of years. Um, I think they're still doing good work. I think they're still working towards uh, their their bigger certification, if you will. Um, um, What's the story with that one? We, it's not in the budget currently. Uh, Madam Chair, Councillor Benton, um, as in past years, uh, because it's in a different category than Knob Hill and Main Street, it's been funded through the, the other dollars that are available for contractual services and economic development. And so for consistency until they complete that certification, we think this is the right approach of, of keeping these Main Streets in this sort of line-itemed, um, specifically named contracts in the non-recurring budget. But then we, we fully intend to continue that relationship with uh, Barilas Main Street. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Neer. And to add to that, Madam Chair and Councillor Benton, it is on the list on the memo that I just handed you. Yeah. Yes, Councillor Borrego. Yeah, um, I just have a general um, observation and kind of comment. Um, and it, it's both for economic development and uh, cultural services. Um, I noticed that there are a lot of um, programs in the downtown area and the inner city neighborhoods. And, and I very much appreciate that because I think that to have a healthy city, we need to have a, a healthy downtown. But I would like to see um, at some point how some of these programs that are being funded can sort of, um, um, you know, be filtered out into some of the outer areas of the city. And um, it may be, you know, and I appreciate that we have Summerfest on the west side, uh, but, you know, there are, there are a lot of people that come downtown, but then there are a lot of people that don't. And I would like to see how, um, you know, uh, and, I, and I, for example, the other day I met with, I think it was 516 Art, is it 516 Arts? And I asked them, um, you know, how could your program be expanded to my district? Um, possibly, you know, to find sort of a, a core area in my district or in districts like mine that are sort of out of the center city. So I would really like for us to kind of think a little bit out of the box and maybe think about how some of these programs can be expanded. Um, to um, sort of um, have an influence on other parts of, of Albuquerque. So I, I, that's just a general comment, and um, I hope that you guys would take that in stride. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Any other questions? Mr. Romero.
Next up, Office of City Clerk. Um, Trina Casados is the acting city clerk. The proposed budget this year, uh, fiscal year 19, is 1.5 million. They have 17 general fund FTEs. Um, there was one-time funding in fiscal year 18 that goes away for 917,000. That was for the election that was held just last fall. Um, internal service costs, technical adjustments, essentially um, there were adjustments of 214,000 for risk, fleet, and communication adjustments. Are there any questions for City Clerk? Uh, Ms. Casados is Elsers. ill tonight, but our CAO can answer questions. CAO can answer questions. Okay, Councillor Harris. Yes, thank you. Um, at the, uh, I guess the last meeting, intergovernmental um, relations meeting, uh, we were uh, learned that th there might be some potential litigation that we have to figure out what the city clerk is going to be doing if we're actually going to be running our own elections or not. Um, and that, of course, affects our budget. So uh, do you know what's going on with that? Because I, we, we passed, an, uh, the state passed a statute, and I think there might be lots of legal uh, problems with it. I mean, one of the obvious legal problems with the statute is that as the statute is written, it would force the city into uh, a combined election. We wouldn't run it, and our um, city charter that has all these provisions for citizen participation would essentially be eliminated because <laughs> the county would decide if they want to put these questions on the ballot or not. That's just one example. Changes the terms of office. Um, doesn't give us any time to actually adjust requires that our charter be changed, and what if we don't do it, or what if the voters don't vote for the changes, then what happens? I mean, and uh, they gave the conservancy districts four years to figure this out, and they give us no time at all. So I, I think there's a lot of potential legal problems with this new state statute, and I'm just wondering if, if there's going to, is there some uncertainty on a, single, on a city legal side as to, as to whether or not uh, we might need to challenge this? Ms. Nair, that was a that's a good one. <laughs> it is. Uh, Madam Chair, Councillor Harris, we share your concerns with the very dramatic and sweeping legislation that the legislature saw fit to enact, taking control of our local elections away from our city and our city clerk. Uh, we are considering whether uh, a legal challenge is appropriate to assert our home rule, uh, not just on this, but on other issues that the legislature sort of saw fit to take charge of. Uh, that said, um, we also have to proceed on a parallel path to prepare in case we do need to make those changes to our charter that would impact um, some, some sort of like mechanical things like the terms would start in January 1st instead of December 1st, as well as some more you know, substantive issues where, that relate to public finance deadlines as well as uh, the campaign deadlines themselves. So we are going down both of those paths now in, in efforts led by our city attorney. <laughs> Uh, how that impacts budget specifically is that um, we haven't really tinkered with the budget on the premise that we will um, be required to follow the state statute. And since we're in an off year, we, we have less of a budget impact than we would if we were in a, an election year. Um, we probably will need any cushion money that we would have had left over for elections to undertake the legal actions we're going to need to take to comply. So either we're going to win in some forum and we're going to need that money for elections or we're going to lose and we're going to need that money to do the reforms that you mentioned that would be necessary to comply with the legislation. Uh, in addition, the city clerk plays that really important role in our Inspection of Public Records Act um, coordination and um, as you're all aware, for the past few years we've gotten hit in court a whole bunch of times on our, on our ability to comply with IPRA. And so we also see a lot of uh, room to improve those processes and um, would definitely look to use any money left over uh, from a change in elections to improve our IPRA process. I think we'd see long-term gains or, or at least um, a balance from our risk program. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Neer. Any other questions? All right, Mr. Moreau, you're almost there. <laughs> Madam Chair, Parks and Recreation is the next department. David Simon is the director. The proposed general fund budget is uh, $34.9 million with 259 general fund positions. There is uh, CIP construction, 
crew is moved from municipal development. That's 24 positions that increase this department's budget by 1.5 million. There's an increase uh, in the subsidy to the golf operating fund of 349,000 in fiscal year 19. And um, we also made an adjustment in fiscal year 18, given the current projection, projection of green fee revenue. So it's needed to shore up the fund this year as well. In fiscal year 19, the budget also includes 200,000 to expand um, and or provide new youth programs, also aimed at attacking public safety or addressing public safety issues in the community. And 108,000 for two positions to the expanded Los Altos Aquatics Facility for capital coming online in fiscal year 19. Are there thank any you. questions for Director Simon? All right, Councilor Harris. Yes, thank you, Mr. Romero. And something I guess maybe could get back to me on. One thing that I've thought of uh, recently, and I talked to Councilor Sanchez at a recent bu budget brief with Ms. Yara about, is that uh, what we have in our parks uh, seems to be more and more is vandalism and vagrant problems, uh, camping, and, and other activities that go on that that are just real unfortunate. And one of the things that could be possible is having uh, city security guards. Uh, maybe not that many, but th there may have to be many if you're doing this citywide. But maybe they could be one, or maybe they could do teams of two, and at night maybe they could just go by and visit the parks and, and uh, keep them safe. And if people are doing things in those parks that they're not supposed to do, then they could uh, get them to stop. Uh, one of the things that uh, affects particularly Councilor Gibson but me as well is the, uh, I think uh, they did a report of, of uh, police reports in parks and there are like 52 incidents in parks and, and over half of those are at Los Altos Park, like 20 some uh, police reports in one park, uh, which used to be partially in my district and the redistricting it all went to Councilor Gibson's district, but I kind of claim it in a way because it's right on the border of my district. And then we have Singing Arrow Park, which is a problem I understand in Councilor Davis's district. You have Wilson Park, which is, it can be, it can be rough um, for, if you want kids to be able to go to school and, and feel comfortable in that place, and a lot of times they don't, or they can't. So I'm wondering if you thought about any of these kind of security measures that might be useful, and maybe we could do a, a, something to put in the budget to study that for next year. Maybe we can add some funds in this budget. And, and I see we have our director. Madam Chair and Councilor Harris, I'll let uh, Director Simon answer. Simon, thank you for being here. Good evening, uh, Madam Chair and uh, Council members. Again, I appreciate the honor of uh, serving the citizens uh, in this position and your interest and support for parks and green spaces. Uh, we, first of all, I have to say I'm very, very proud of the efforts of the park staff who uh, do an excellent job with the resources they have to keep our parks clean and safe. They are working really hard to do that. So as we know, you know, there are manifestations of social issues that show up in parks. We're just a reflection of the society at large. So uh, this is a very, very important issue for me personally to try to tackle. So we're discussing the, with the administration, with APD, with our partner uh, departments such as family and community, uh, and of course with the council, a number of both physical and pro programmatic approaches we could take to try to make the parks uh, clean and safe. Yes, Councilor Harris. Yes, and in particular, I'm just wondering if you're considering city security guards, because a security guard doesn't uh, cost nearly as much money as a sworn officer. And it's perfectly appropriate to use a security guard for city property. So I'm just wondering if that's in your mix of things you're considering. Uh, Madam Chair, Councillor Harris, uh, the, the short answer is yes, and, and we also think this might be a good use for some of our police service aides um, who, when there's not big events, sometimes we don't always have places to call them out. I would just also like to add that uh, we, we've started a public safety coordination meeting of, of the key public safety departments um, three, three weeks a month, and uh, Director Simon actually just asked to become a permanent member of that meeting. People don't usually ask to be in more meetings, uh, <laughs> but he did because he really grasps what a huge part of, that uh, of his job is uh, public safety, and so I'd just like to, to acknowledge that he is really focused on that. Thank you, and uh, yeah, I know. I was trying to get rid of you first. Can Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, we had discussed oh, a while ago with the, the former uh, Parks Director um, 
about possibly putting cameras in there at the park. Um, they're pricey. I think they're about seventy-five, eighty thousand dollars camera, oh, trailer, trailer-mounted cameras. So, um, have you considered that, or has there been any recent discussion about about using uh, trailer-mounted cameras? Madam Chair, uh, Councilor Gibson, you know the, the film industry is doing great in New Mexico. So anything involving more cameras is probably a good idea. Um, <laughs> yes, we have already installed uh, new camera security systems at three facilities recently using a state grant. We started with some of our aquatic pool facilities. So we've installed cameras at Wilson Pool at Montgomery and at the Sunport uh, Pool. And it's too early to tell mm -hmm. um, just how effective they'll be in deterring crime. Um, I just happen to think they're one tool in what has to be a comprehensive approach. Sure. Um, and they generally have run about $30,000 per site um, when you install cameras like this. So. Yeah. So these would be installed like on the, on the, the light? Uh, yeah, we, you know. you, you, we really assess each site, uh, counselor, to see where the best kind of coverage and prevention effect would be from cameras, mm -hmm. and you deploy the cameras appropriately. Yeah. See, and, but and we, we've already seen some, I guess I'd say it's too early to tell. We'll have to have a whole summer to really observe the mm -hmm. efficacy of these. But I think we've seen some preliminary uh, improvement at Wilson Pool. And I will also say we, uh, APD is very generous. They've loaned us a, a, a trailer, mobile trailer. It's connected to the real-time center as all the cameras are. And that provides what I'd call a temporary moderate benefit when we put that trailer out in a park. But it is... Temporary. Sure. So, and you know, that pool will be finished, uh, I'm not sure when, this fall, I think. Um, the Los Altos ball, pool. Yes, Councilor. We're, we're hoping the project will be completed in October. Right. So, um, that and the fact that, you know, there are other things that attract kids. We already had one very, very bad incident there a few years ago. I, you know, I think maybe we should revisit the idea of of uh, putting cameras in. The, and, and, you know, I think that the, the trailer mounted cameras actually do two things. Not only do they record what's happening, um, uh, but they also, um, um, you know, they, they serve as like a warning to people. They're big, they're hard to miss, you know. The ones that we put up on light fixtures, uh, um, unless we have signs out, people don't see them, you know. So it's just a way of letting people know that they're being watched. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Councilor Sanchez. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Director Simon, the mobile cameras have worked in the past. Uh, we do have them at uh, Pat Hurley Park and other parks throughout the west side. And I would hope that we can incorporate and purchase more of those cameras because that has been a very effective tool in deterring some of the crime that we are dealing with in some of the parks. But I do like the idea uh, maybe hiring more security to go out to the different parks. Uh, we still have Lavaland Park closed down. We're going to be meeting on that uh, sometime next week. And the residents don't want that park reopened. And that's unfortunate because that's a benefit to the residents of that community. But if they are fearful of sending their kids to that park because of human feces on the playground equipment, on the sidewalks, and needles buried in the sand and throughout the park, uh, that's not a benefit to the community. But I think we need to work in collaboration with the administration in trying to find ways to make our parks safe where people want to be at the parks and take their families to these parks. One other question I have is I'm also looking at, you're saying there's going to be FY19 proposed budget, which includes $200,000 to expand or provide new youth programs. And then I look at uh, one of the other departments is also looking at another $500,000 appropriation for youth programs. Do we have a breakdown of what those programs are going to be? Um, Ms. Nair, it looks like it's yours. <laughs> uh, Madam Chair, Councillor Sanchez, I can give an overview and then uh, Director Simon can go into a little de more detail in his department specifically. But what we did was we had each department say, we asked each of those three departments that got appropriations for expanded after school, that would be family, community services, cultural services, and parks, to come up with the cheapest way to double 
participation, uh, youth participation in their programs, because that's our overall goal. And so they each came up with different ideas, and of course they have to be fleshed out in more detail over the coming months if we receive that money. Um, but that, that was the basis for it, and I can turn it over to Director Simon to talk about some of his ideas that included the Bosque, uh, some of the Bosque related programs and youth athletics. Well, thank you, Madam Chair and, and uh, Councilor Sanchez. This is an initiative that I'm extremely excited about, not just for the positive impacts you know, on children uh, and the fun and joy that they get from doing these things, but because of the community impact and social impact and public safety impact that we know these programs um, will produce. So I'm very, very excited uh, to try to have a chance to work on these. Uh, at, at parks, uh, you know, the first thing I'd say is our, our programs, after school, summer programs, they touch every district in the city. So we're, we spread out these services uh, robustly around the city. And as we look to expand them, what I want to do is, is continue that. I want to make sure we're serving all, as many kids as we can across the city. Uh, also, uh, I, wanna, I think the smart, prudent approach is to build on uh, existing effective programs where we can scale them up and maybe we'll pilot a few new ones for effectiveness. But uh, for us, we can easily scale up programs such as aquatics programs, swim lessons. Personally believe every child in our city should learn how to swim. We have an outstanding bicycle safety uh, and awareness <coughs> program. This is an easy way to scale up um, very, very good programs for kids. We can scale up some sports programs using the existing facilities we have, tennis, pickleball, uh, the athletic fields. And then I'm very, very excited about uh, continuing our work to introduce more children to nature. So uh, we had some, heard some earlier speakers on that and we have a great program to bring kids into the Bosque and we want to pilot a little bit more of that. And those can be prioritized in areas where uh, are areas of the city that are a little bit more underserved and don't get those opportunities. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Borrego. Um, good evening, Mr. Simon. I think I saw you at Isotopes on Saturday. Was that you? I can uh, confirm <laughs> that rumor, yes. <laughs> I thought it was you. Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about some of the um, concerns in my district particularly. There was a shooting at one of our parks over off of Rainbow by Volcano Vista School. And, um, you know, we have parks way out, Ventana West, and, you know, the lighting is really very poor in some of those areas. And, um, I, you know, I, I want to reiterate what they said about the cameras because um, I, I happen to know that there's some there's at least one camera on one of our arroyos and maybe looking at other agencies and how we can coordinate because I know some of our parks are adjacent to trails and they're also adjacent to arroyos so maybe there's some coordination that can be done with that um, and that would help save us some money as well um, and the other thing that I would just like to um, bring up to you is some of the ADA accessibility in some of the parks and um, you know I know that it's costly but it's also something that we need to service all of our residents um, so I guess with that segue I'll just ask that maybe you and I meet because I have some concerns about some of the areas but thank you counselor and I look forward to those conversations and for your suggestions thank you counselors any more questions counselor Davis Mine's quick. Uh, I just wanted to follow with Council Chance as you started down where I was going. Uh, Mr. Simon, I, I got to tell you, <clears throat> excuse me, and Ms. Nair, thank you for y'all's commitment to harm reduction in our parks. I know we're working through some new things now to look at how we can better service uh, people who use our parks for place, sanctuary, safe places to hang out. And I appreciate that very much. And I also appreciate your department's attention to Wilson. It's been a problem area for a while. Um, and we're already seeing some benefits from the early work there. So thank you. Uh, it's paid off with folks at the school who noticed. Uh, I do want to ask about the extra $200,000 for, in your department, for those after school and at risk children programs. I know you're ramping up stuff, which is great. Um, but for the new ideas or folks who have new proposals or programs that are working in the community that are not yet partnered or, or uh, connected to the city, can you commit to or can you tell us about the process that will facilitate a, uh, 
public participation and, and helping to determine what programs might be new, good new partners to pilot with the city. Um, will you have a public process? Will you have a committee? Do you know yet uh, how groups who are doing good work could partner with the city and use those new resources? Madam Chair, uh, Councillor Davis, uh, first of all, I think we'll be open to good ideas that are good fits for parks. I think it's always wise to keep in mind your core competencies, whether you're in business or in government. And I think it makes sense for parks to work and continue to work in the areas where we're strong and where we can make, we can be good partners with other organizations. So I think uh, so part of the answer to your question depends on funding as to what kind of process we take to allocate whatever dollars are provided. And I just haven't been able to get as far into this as I need to be to ask this question, and we can do it later. Do you know, Mr. Simon, out of that 200000 what do you expect to be sort of ramp-up programs and what percentage you intend to be new? Uh, if I may, uh, Madam Chair, Councillor Davis, uh, we, we gave uh, the directors in those three departments a mandate to come up not only with the, the cheapest but the quickest way to scale up. And so, uh, you know, just to be fair to them, yeah. we did not give them a, a whole lot of time to come up with an elaborate plan. Um, but, you know, you, you know uh, especially Director Simon Will, yeah. I think in terms <laughs> of a uh, more uh, public process, I think it's an excellent idea. We want to get more kids in the programs this summer. Yeah. So we're going to prioritize those efforts. And we can also use this summer to sort of expand our our view and our net and involve the public in things that might be more appropriate for after school, for school programs during the school year. But uh, assuming we get the funding this summer, we're just going to um, ask Director Simon to hit the accelerator on the things that we can, we know we can do and do well. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Dave. Thank you, Ms. Nair. Are there any other questions? All right. Uh, Mr. Romero. Okay, members of the committee, the last department is Senior Affairs. Um, Director Ana Sanchez is here. The proposed general fund budget for Senior Affairs is 10.3 million, funding 64 full-time equivalent positions. We have the creation of three full-time term positions to prepare for hosting the 20, 2019 National Senior Games. There's also a, a one-time appropriation of two million in their budget for the same purpose and 376,000 in the transfer to Fund 250, which is where the majority of the employees supporting the AAA grant are housed. And with that, um, are there any questions for Director Sanchez? Thank you, Mr. Romero. Are there any questions? Councillor Sanchez. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, I have one question. And in the earlier discussions, they said that the rates and the fees were gonna be going up for our seniors. What is the current fee right now? Is it $14 annually? Madam Chair, Councillor Sanchez, the fee currently stands at $15. And it's going to be going from 15 to 20? To 20. Have you gauged the uh, senior citizen community uh, regarding those increases? Because many of our seniors in this community are on a fixed income. And for some of those individuals, that may seem like a substantial increase of $5 annually. Have you talked to the seniors about this increase? Go ahead. Uh, Madam Chair and Councillor Sanchez, um, certainly in my short eight weeks, I've had many conversations with some of our constituents. Um, certainly we provide a great service and programs at a great value. Um, we certainly would never deny anyone services of our facilities or our programs at all. So we actually um, take a very, very broad stance with being able to, to make sure that we accommodate citizens from our community. So if somebody does not have the resources, they would still be accommodated and could attend our senior centers, is that correct? Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Director. Are there any other questions? Um, yes, Councilor Harris. Probably for Mr. Romero, I forgot on cultural services, but you had a lot of folks from the Balloon Museum who uh, were concerned that the, the fees are going up, but they're not getting a bigger cut. And uh, I didn't really want to ask the, the advocates at the time, but uh, tell me what's going on with that, and is it something that we should be worried about? I guess you've got the director up here. Yeah. If I may. Um, I've got three choices here. <laughs> <laughs> Director Sanchez, if you'd like to answer, you could do that. Um, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Counselor, could you just repeat your question? I was kind of halfway up on. Oh, sure. Uh, we have several people from the Bloon Museum, and I think that one of the themes that uh, I heard is that 
and it looks like it's true that the fees for the Bloom Museum are going up some. The, the, the gate fees looks like they're going up, and I think the uh, the people from the board or the foundation think that they should get a, a cut of that or something. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm sure you, you're more knowledgeable about their arguments than I am based on what I heard tonight, but tell me, could you give me the, the background and the department's position? Um, well, the department's position is that um, we were all asked to really do our best to raise revenue for the city um, because we definitely had some structural deficits. And so that was uh, a place that we could uh, raise revenue at both museums. Our museums are very much under in terms of admission fees compared to other cities in the region. Um, and I think it's, it's natural that the advocates of that museum want some of that money to come back to them. And I think it's um, just that simple. So tell me, how, what percentage of the gate do they get now? And what percentage of the funding for the museum do they raise? I mean, if you define some sort of... Um, historically, uh, admission fees go into the general fund. And so that's, um, that's just how it has worked historically. In terms so of percentage that, that they raise through uh, revenue? So they don't uh, get any share of the gate now? No, it goes into the general fund. Is that correct? Okay. Ms. Nayer. Uh, Madam Chair, Councillor Harris, uh, yeah, it's it's not just a it's not a direct line like that where they get a percentage. So whatever they get in the budget ha bears some relationship to what they raise at the gate. Uh, I think the the request that was did the piece of their request that was denied was actually a fairly technical. They actually wanted to take that increase or that delta in revenue and put it into sort of a special revenue fund that could only be used for them. And so we denied that because uh, coming from the auditor's office, we know that special revenue funds are a giant pain in accounting, and they just, they're sort of a setup to mess up. Uh, also, we know that the city was facing a structural deficit and didn't think it was financially prudent to commit all of those revenues to be solely used for the Balloon Park Museum. That said, we'd be happy to um, use the money for the things that they've requested. It's just a, a matter of whether it's uh, solely designated for that purpose or not. We denied the, the sole designation, but we didn't say that we wouldn't spend that money at the museum. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councilor Harris. Thank you, Director. We still have here Director of Senior Affairs. Are there any other questions? I guess not, thank you. You're doing a very good job. Thank you all. Mr. Romero, do you have a closing on this? Madam Chair, th thank you very okay. much. Um, I just also want to recognize budget staff who've put in a lot of long hours and weekends and uh, thank you for your support. We look forward to talking with you again on the 10th. Thank you, Mr. Romero. So, councilors, I, yeah, I would like to move deferral of R24, appropriating funds for operating the government of the city of Albuquerque for fiscal year 2019, beginning July, okay. Move deferral to May 10th. There's a second. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Say yes. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Also, I would like to move deferral to May 18th of R25, establishing a one-year objectives for the city of Albuquerque. All those in, I, do I have a motion and a second? Second. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor, say yes. 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 See you all on May 10th. Thank you. The meeting is adjourned.